Good evening and welcome. I hope you felt welcomed when you came in tonight. Uh, our Leisure Services Director, Robert Carolyn, and Public Works Director, Sean Finley, served as our greeters this evening. Uh, it is January 18th, 2022. This is the second regular City Commission meeting of the City of Ormond Beach, and we are in Commission Chambers. Uh, I'd like to introduce the folks who are sitting up in front of you. To my right, your left, Reporting Secretary Taylor Lockhart, City Clerk Susan Dodderis, Commissioner Dwight Selby from Zone 1. Good evening, everybody. Commissioner Troy Kent from Zone 2. And to my left, your right, our Deputy Mayor and Zone 3 Commissioner Susan Persis. Good evening, everyone. Zone 4 Commissioner Rob Littleton, our City Manager Joyce Shanahan. Assistant City Manager Claire Whitley and our City Attorney Randy Hayes. And then way to the left, way to your right, are the Chiefs <laughs> joining us this night, police and fire. And uh, for those of you listening online, I'm Mayor Phil Partington. At this time, if you would, please silence your cell phones and rise for the invocation, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. The invocation tonight given by Deacon Maline Wells Stowe from the Church of the Holy Child. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of serving you as both citizens and leaders in this beautiful place we get to call home. Help us always to remember that we are but stewards of that which is yours. We pray that you will send down the spirit of wisdom charity and justice on those who hold office here in Ormond Beach, that with steadfast purpose they may faithfully serve in their offices to promote the well-being of all your people. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. time if uh, Brian Daly our parade chairman will come forward we'll have the presentation of the awards from our incredible Christmas parade great job Brian I think it's good to be back after a year off I'm here for the uh, home for the holidays parade committee to announce our winners for the 30th annual home for the holidays parade uh, first I'd like to thank our sponsors who made it all possible. New Smyrna Chevrolet, The Money Pages, Realty Pros, The Motor Depot, SR Parat, Heart Pro Realty, Tomoka Eye, Hometown News, and Ormond Beach Main Street, along with our uh, parade board, Brian Nave, Daryl Grabowski, Dane Riddell, Travis Sargent, Paul Mena, Chris Massabo, Janie Ray, Julio, Julia Trulio, our judges, Gail Burgess, Dillis Harris, and Rebecca Nave, and our city advisors, Robert Carolyn, Stefan Sibley, Sonia Johnson, and my personal favorite, Siobhan Daly. <laughs> uh, the streets department and especially the police department. This year with as many people as we had, that was a chore for them. Probably by far the most people we've ever had at one of our parades. Uh, so we'll go ahead with the uh, prize winners now in the Walker division. If you're here, you can just wave your hand and say, say hi or something, and we're gonna go out here after I announce them all and take pictures and give you your awards, if you don't mind. Third place in the Walker Division is Ormond Beach Elementary. <laughs> Second place in the Walker's Division, Charlie Bond Christmas by, at St. Brendan's. <laughs> First place, the Sunrise Community of Girl Scouts. And in our vehicles, which could also almost be floats, some of them. Third place, Daniel's Lawn and Landscaping. <laughs> Second place, the perennial winner, Tomoka Outpost. <laughs> First place, also a perennial winner, Universal Towing. 
And then our floats division, I think we had close to 60 floats this year, 90 entries, about 2,000 people in the parade. The floats division, any one of these three could have won. It was so close, the judges really had a hard time with this one. But third place, and this was an awesome float, goes to Ormond Memorial Art Museum and Gardens. <laughs> Second place, East Coast Ornamental Welding. <laughs> and first place, the Beach Bucket. <laughs> Our Best of Show this year was an awesome entry. Uh, the Tomoka Performing Arts from a Tomoka Elementary School. Best of show. Now I'd like to invite Bill Pardington up to do the uh, Main Street Cup, which is the like Hudderdale Cup for the best business uh, entry in the parade. And if the rest of the winners can come out into the uh, atrium, we'll do our prizes out there. And thank you all. Let me see if I can do this. Talk, speaking to the audience. The Reich 100 Mark Cup is the, uh, the cup that Ormon Main Street presents to the uh, best business. Um, I was honored to be the Grand Marshal of the parade this year, so I get to uh, present the cup, the cup. And the winner is Abaco Windows for 2021. and we will move to audience remarks. First up, I have Robert Pearson. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Robert Pearson. I've lived in the city of Warren Beach for over 35 years. I'm also a member of the Warren Beach Police Department. I would like to begin by thanking you for the opportunity to speak this evening and also to thank you, our city commission, for the continuous support of your law enforcement officers. On October 19th, I came before the commission and spoke to you about several issues with the police department to include our pay. I also provided you with documentation to show where the Orm Beach Police Department stacked up against other agencies within the county in relation to pay and pension. The commission took the documentation, did their research, and approached the union with a memorandum of understanding. Within this memorandum, the commission intends of, on providing our officers with a salary adjustment mid-contract. A salary adjustment will hopefully help retain our current officers and attract others to join our department. On behalf of the officers of the Orm Beach Police Department, I would like to thank Mayor Partington and the commission for making this happen. I would also like to thank Chief Godfrey, Joyce Shanahan, our city manager, Claire Whitley, our assistant city manager, and Samantha Potts, our human resources director, for all their efforts to make this salary adjustment happen. The officer of the Orm Beach Police Department look forward to working with the commission in the upcoming contract negotiations. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Chris Peterson. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners. My name is Chris Peterson, and I represent the Florida Peace Funding Agency and its capital providers. <clears throat> I'm here before you today to encourage the Commission to adopt PACE financing for uh, the City of Ormond Beach, uh, similar to Daytona Beach, Daytona Beach Shores, Edgewater, New Smyrna Beach, Port Orange, Orange City. Your neighbors have all adopted, uh, and we would love the opportunity to, to serve your residents. PACE is a way to finance energy efficient and wind resistant improvements and this payback over time uh, on the property taxes. This is for both residential and commercial. And actually what brought me here today is one of our commercial providers does have a deal uh, pending that they would like to be able to execute on. Uh, if you know anything about capital stacks, uh, PACE can can, for commercial properties can replace mezzanine financing, save three or four points, which is a pretty big deal when you're dealing with multi-million dollar uh, improvements. So, for residential property owners, those that maybe need a roof reinsurance, this is a way to do this without any money out of pocket. Uh, program has evolved significantly. It's, it's, it's a, uh, significantly different than it was several years ago. And we're real proud to come stand here before you today and, and make sure that uh, you know that we exist and, and know that we can uh, uh, start to work with the, your city manager, city attorney, get that resolution in the works. Um, presentation to the board, happy to provide that for you at any, at any point. So 
Um, I will follow up with each of you with a pres uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation so you can read a little bit more about it. And if you'd like to learn more about the commercial deal, then you can respond and we can talk about it offline. So thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity. Everybody have a nice night. Thank you. Thank you. Travis Sargent. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners. I'd like to bring up a couple points. Uh, my family and I love going to um, the casements with the kids and walk around. Over the last couple months, we've noticed a lot more homeless people um, in the parks and um, kind of being dis uh, disruptive. My wife called me yesterday at the office and said, Travis, what do I do? Can I call 911? Someone's um, not acting right. Of course, you know, it's, it's difficult, but maybe we can um, offer some help to these people. I don't know if we're utilizing the one-step shelter. I know we donated, I think, eighty to $90,000. I think we've only um, sent about two people to that since its um, inception. Maybe we can start utilizing that more or find help for these people. Second issue would be um, possibly uh, putting speed bumps of some sort in front of the casements. People fly down that road. And if you ask any of the residents that walk their dogs um, or are just out jogging in the morning or anything, it's a serious issue. Thank you. Connie Colby. Good evening. Connie Colby, 108 Robo Lane, Ormond Beach. I'm a little late to the party. I just started reading your budget from last year and looking through it. There are a couple of things that I'm interested in, but I know you have a lot on your agenda tonight. But one thing I would like to ask about tonight, <clears throat> one of the items that is in the Municipal Airport Fund says that you want to execute an amended and restated lease agreement between the city and the River, River Bend Golf Course. I don't quite understand what that's about because I thought that was all over and done with. <clears throat> and maybe at some point somebody could explain that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to the approval of the minutes from the city commission meeting of January 4th, 2022. They've been sent to the commission for review, posted to the city's website as well. Any additions, deletions, or corrections, commission? I move, to, I move approval for the minutes of the January 4th, 2022 meeting. That moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. We'll show those passing unanimously and move to uh, the consent agenda. Does any commissioner wish to pull any item from the consent agenda? Move approval of the consent agenda. Mayor, I'd like to, I'm sorry, to write. That's all right, never Mayor, mind, like, I'll, I'll withdraw that motion. I'd like to pull item E. Motion to approve consent agenda absent item E. Second. Moving seconded. Please call the vote. Commissioner Selby. Yes. Commissioner Kent. Yes. Commissioner Persis. Yes. Commissioner Littleton. Yes. Mayor Partington. Yes. Seven. Resolution number 2022-13, a resolution accepting a proposal from Mead and Hunt, Inc. to provide preliminary engineering design services regarding the Western Utility Plant Facility Planning Project, authorizing the execution of a work authorization thereto and setting forth an effective date. This is resolution number 2022-13, read by title only. Thank you. I don't have any cards. You need a motion to I'll make a motion for discussion? Second. I second. Moved and seconded. And I guess we'll start with Commissioner Self. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, this is a $127,500 uh, contract. Um, and I hadn't really heard much about it, so I thought maybe staff give staff the opportunity to explain what we're doing. Gives a chance to talk to you about this this evening. Um, this is something an item that was first brought to um, everyone's attention in the 2015 utility master plan. Um, as we get, as we grow, as our utility facilities take on more services, we're required at 75 to 80 percent capacity point to start taking a look at what we need to do to expand that plan or expand, expand our services. Um, so what we're doing with this one is we're going to do that first step of the planning process. With that property that the city owns, it's adjacent to Airport Road, State Road 40, um, on, or Airport Road on, on West State Road 40. There's four different things that we could do in a situation like this when we need to do plan expansion. 
Number one is always the do nothing alternative, which I don't think any of us would want to recommend doing. We want to be prepared. We want to be get out in front of everything. We want to be ready for the future. We could expand our current facility, which we're starting to get a little bit cramped there on Orchard Street at, at, the, at the wastewater plant. We want to make sure that we, we have you know, sufficient room to do those facilities. The other disadvantage to expanding that facility is a lot of our growth is west. Um, Hunters Ridge, Breakaway Trails, Foreman Crossings, and of course the, the other project that, that's coming to, the, to, to West um, State Road 40, the Avalon Daytona project. By putting a second facility out west, number one, we get a chance to do a new, pro we, get, we, get a, we have the redundancy of having more than one facility. We also cut some of our costs by, it's, it's less to pump it back into town. We're pumping it there to the source where it's being generated. And then when we create that reclaimed water, we're, we're, it's already in that, in that area where it'll be used by Hunters Ridge, Breakaway Trails, Ormond Crossings. Um, third, third option would be to build a whole new plant out there. I don't know that that's, that's, that would make good use of our resources by abandoning our current facility. And the fourth is, is what we're doing here, we're proposing with this, is to build a second facility out west to kind of split, split the load, um, not take a little bit of the load of what's being currently pumped across town through our, through our wastewater facilities. This project is going to do that preliminary work on the project. It's going to do survey. Um, this is a current survey that we have of the property. Um, it's a pretty good property. There's a there's the yellow line that I just drew. There is a is an upland that goes upland road that goes through it for the fire lines. There's minimal wetlands there, so it's a pretty high and dry, pretty good um, uh, ability to do development on this property. We've identified it's been identified as a utility property since it was get, um, conveyed to us from Hunters Ridge. Um, it's the logical place for us to do that, and so we're going to do that step of doing the preliminary design, doing site planning of the, of the property, doing technology selection, trying to trying to get a feel for it before we go full into a, a design, which you know is going to happen in the next decade probably. And if there's any other questions, I'm happy to answer. I mean, I just I wonder how much of this the need at that location is driven by Avalon Daytona. I would say we we put an estimate of it being about a little bit over 50 percent. We've we've estimated that the flows probably are going to be generated to what we're going to do out there would be about 58, 60 percent of there. So um, you know, good deal of it is from that project. There's also the 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 the, the, the utility customers that we have in the other locations and in, in other future locations, Hunters Ridge. You know, we're, we're we're their utility provider. It's closer to Ormond Crossings, and so there is a, there's a lot of future development that will also that could be diverted in this direction and then some, or some current development that could be diverted in this direction and some other future development that would you know, more likely and logically go in this direction. The, the concern I have about this is, um, you know, when you mentioned 58 to 60 percent, this board has never really officially said that we're going to be the utility provider for Avalon Daytona. We've never had a workshop on Avalon Daytona. We have never you know, said we were going to do that. And when I look at the city of Ormond Beach, there's really very little land in Ormond Beach out 40 to the west that can be developed. But there's a lot of land up US-1, near the I-95 and US-1 with Ormond Crossings and with Plantation Oaks that is already, you know, under construction now. And I just wonder, it seems to me that maybe if a second uh, water treatment, a wastewater treatment plant or a water treatment plant is needed that to serve the citizens of Ormond Beach, because Ormond really can't expand out 40. I mean, we're, we're landlocked by Flagler County and by the uh, State Park and so forth and by Daytona. But we do have room, we do have thousands of acres in Ormond Crossings, and that'll be thousands of homes also up that way. Did we look at that at all? I mean, is that a consideration at all, that, we've, that we've, those we've, facilities should be northwest, let's call it, instead of straight west? We've, we've looked, we've, we've done some modeling that, that would utilize utilizing this, this site for, for those purposes. Um, we do own this property, and that, that, that makes it highly advantageous for us. It was conveyed to the city for utility purposes, so that makes it even more of a logical location to do some sort of a utility facility. Um, have we looked at other locations on North US one for express for expressly for purposes for utility plant? No, I can't tell you that we do so. Okay. And Sean, isn't it true? I mean, as part of the long range planning process, I forget the exact number, but is it like 
75% once you hit that capacity level, isn't this included in our master plan to start <coughs> planning for something like this? Correct, and, and we're and we're anticipating that simple organic growth is going to get us to that point sometime this decade. Okay. And if there were to be, I don't know, a thousand homes that ended up going at Orman Crossings in the next five or ten years, would that be something where, this might be better for Stephen, but where the developer of that residential area of Orman Crossings, which is all west of 95, they would uh, set aside a parcel of land where we could have a, a third facility Possibly. Good evening, Stephen Straker, Planning Director. There is nothing that I'm aware of in their um, development order that requires that. It could always be negotiated as as the project comes in. But I'm not aware there's any uh, identified site for that presently. Just thinking, you know, Commissioner Selby's making a good point as far as where you want to place these uh, when you're looking at where the future growth is. 20, 30 years, that might be a possibility and something for staff to keep on their radar uh, as part of the negotiation process or, or otherwise. Um, any other questions, Commissioner? Yeah, I mean, let me make sure I understand this. So we're not at that 80% threshold yet? We're rapidly approaching it. And, and, and you know, should we, should some of these other projects come online? We've got, we've got projects that are in first submittal that are part of, of Hunter's Ridge, that are going to be part of uh, of, of Foreman Crossing that could be coming come up. Obviously, there is a project, the, 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 the Avalon Day Tunnel Project is being talked about. Those projects would take us over that 80%. So it's, it's the time to, to really begin to start thinking about planning is, 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 is the, in the end of the future, yes. Yeah, I, I, Commission, I, um, I see this as, you know, really driven by Avalon Daytona and for that reason I'm going to vote against this. I don't have enough information to know whether or not this is the appropriate place for a future plant like that or plants like that. Um, I don't know enough about the Avalon Daytona whole project and our commitment to it. The, the city attorney provided us a lengthy uh, document. I have a copy of the the January 2020 Western mm -hmm. Service Area Master Plan update. Um, and I'm concerned about, I, I, I believe that, you know, this is primarily driven by Avalon Daytona and our um, uh, obligation, if we choose to accept it, to provide them water and sewer on a wholesale basis. And uh, we haven't decided that we want to do that. And so to that extent, I'm going to vote no on this because I don't know enough about it to invest $127,500 of our of our citizens money in a plan that for for facilities that might not ever get built and um, uh, so that's that's where I stand Randy. yes sir thank you um, I'll see if I can add some clarification to uh, Sean's uh, comments so the property uh, was conveyed to the city uh, we own feed title to it back in approximately 1991 um, as part of this of the uh, development order that was um, mandated by the state of Florida for the Hunters Ridge um, <clears throat> it's designated in the DRI as a regional uh, wastewater and wastewater facility plant for Arm and Beach um, it hasn't developed um, so although we've owned it for um, some decades now it hasn't been developed because there's been no real present need for development of that particular site um, several years ago, the city in Flagler County entered into an agreement for Ormond Beach to be the, <clears throat> excuse me, the water and, and sewer provider for uh, customers in Hunters Ridge. Um, this project will help uh, the city meet its commitment to Hunters Ridge for that purpose. Uh, additionally, uh, I will remind the commission uh, that it is driven primarily by th those facts only. Um, it will it can serve a dual purpose in helping the city meet its commitment under the 2006 settlement agreement between Ormond and Daytona regarding the Daytona Avalon product well, regarding the development entitlements that existed back in 2006 which is a much more limited um, uh, form of development now you have the right from a policy perspective to engage in a fuller discussion in terms of what you want to do but uh, this project will 
go a long way to help you meet your, uh, your, your commitments that you have um, uh, made presently and uh, by prior commissions. I just want to add that clarification. Thank you. Can Thank you. Mayor, may I ask a question? Yes. Uh, Mr. Hayes, the, the, um, the future homes uh, that are planned in the Flagler County portion of, um, of Hunter's Ridge, will they push us over the 80% threshold? That's, a, that's an engineering question. I can't answer that. Okay. All right. Um, and are we, because the DRI dedicated some land for a regional water and wastewater plant, are we obligated to build a plant there? Do we have to build a plant there because the DRI, you know, included a commitment by the developer to dedicate land for that? That, that is a designated use by virtue of the DRI. If you wanted to do a use other than what's uh, prescribed by the DRI, then you would have to amend the DRI That's, to allow yeah, that. Yeah, I get that. My question is, do we have to build a wastewater and water plant there? Um, well, that's, a, that's kind of a policy question based on needs, and that's something that you need to discuss with your colleagues. Up okay, so that, okay, so the answer would be no, then. We don't have to do that. We're not obligated to do it. Well, it would depend on contractual commitments um, and those, um, those kinds of things. So it's not an easy yes or no answer. It would depend on a lot of other factors that you would need to weigh in your decision-making process. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that because the DRI said this land is for that purpose, that we weren't obligated to, that didn't lock us in to have to build a plant there. Stri strictly speaking, no. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna vote for it. Um, I don't believe it's uh, driven by Avalon at all. Avalon was supposed to start a year ago, maybe longer in the past, and there's still uh, no substantial activity of any kind out there. So Avalon may happen or it may not happen. It's something that's plan for the future um, this is just good good planning for the city and I think it needs to happen regardless of what happens with our western total western utility service area we're the utility provider for a portion of Avalon uh, so at some point if Avalon does develop we should at least have the capacity to, to serve them this may be a step in that direction but also serves Flagler County, which has some unique challenges in that section of, of Hunter's Ridge. And whether you're pumping it up and down Granada, where we have quite a bit of infrastructure, or pumping it up and down US-1, I don't really think makes a huge difference uh, with the understanding that depending on how many homes happen in Mormon crossings, I think the cap on that is 3,000. Uh, you may have to have some kind of substation up that way at some point uh, just to relieve the stress on these other two areas so uh, because this was in the master plan and uh, prior to, to really any Avalon concerns I still I still support it Deputy Mayor first and I just want to add um, in 2018 I had a tour of tour with the the people that run our water who do such a fabulous job and that was something they told me in 2018 that they needed this extra tank out there to um, to provide people with their the water out there there are some issues that is my zone and there are some issues out there with water I just want to make sure that those residents have you know an apt supply of water thank you thank you and that struck another thought with me too which is a breakaway in the Ormond Beach section of Hunters Ridge runs on a system that I dislike which is the pep tank system and this would give us some where if we ever uh, made the decision to put them on a better system in those nicer neighborhoods in our city uh, west of 95 we would have the capacity to do that so that's just another just another thought anyone else please call the board. commissioner kent yes commissioner persis yes commissioner littleton yes commissioner selby no Mayor Partington. Yes. Now would be the appropriate time if any commissioner wanted to comment on any of the consent agenda items. Deputy Mayor Persons. Yes, I'm just so thrilled that um, we have Evelyn, our, um, our wonderful um, victim advocate for people in Ormond Beach. She does a fabulous job, and I've heard so many 
great stories uh, for the, from the people that she's helped. So I just wanted to hope somebody out there who sees her, I'm going to call her, but will please tell her congratulations. Thank you, Dr. Mack. Well said. And anyone else? With that, we will move to public hearings. I'll open the public hearings, and we will start with 8A. Ordinance number 2021-44, an ordinance amending the City of Ormond Beach Comprehensive Plan by creating a new property rights element, including goals, objectives, and policies, providing that private property rights are considered in local decision-making in accordance with Florida Statute Section 163.31776I, providing for transmitting copies of the notice and amendment to the state reviewing agencies, the County of Volusia, and any other local government or governmental agency requesting a copy, providing for public hearings, providing for conflicting ordinances, and setting forth an effective date. This is the second reading of ordinance number 2021-44, read by title only. Thank you, Susan. I don't have any cards. Move approval of ordinance 2021-44. Second the motion. Move and second it. Any discussion? Please call the vote. Commissioner Persis. Yes. Commissioner Littleton? Yes. Commissioner Selby? Yes. Commissioner Kent? Yes. Mayor Partington? Yes. 8B. Ordinance number 2021-01, an ordinance authorizing the execution and issuance of a planned residential de development, development order for the Tattersall at Timber Creek subdivision, authorizing a phase subdivision of 140 three lots on 84.14 plus acres to be located at 304 North Timber Creek Road, parcel ID number 4124-00-00-0240-2099 Airport Road, parcel ID number 4123-00-00-0012 and 374 North Timber Creek Road, parcel ID number 4124-00-00-024-0250, establishing conditions and expiration of approval and setting forth an effective date. This is the first reading of ordinance number 2022-01, read by title only. Thank you. And I'll ask Planning Director Stephen Spraker to start us off. Good evening, my name is Steven Spraker, Planning Director with the City of Warren Beach. Uh, this is a request for the issuance of a development order. The site is shown on the screen, it's at the intersection of North Timber Creek Road and Airport Road. To the west of the property is a city parcel with water tower, Leeway Trail, and Deer Creek. To the south of the property is Pathways Elementary. There are single family homes in unincorporated Volusia County located here. And then on the east side, these are again unincorporated uh, single family lots within Volusia County. Southern Pines Development is located to the east. And then to the north, there are large lots along Timber Creek and then the Durrance Acres further, further north. For the property, um, this property has a suburban low density residential land use and it requires a planned residential development. It has to go through a three step process. The first is this planned residential development process. This is a zoning document. So uh, it has to go to our site plan review committee. A neighborhood meeting was conducted. They went to the planning board for review and recommendation. The recommendation was for denial by a five to one vote. And then it comes to the city commissioner for final action where you consider all the previous steps and the information in your packet and testimony tonight. This process does not require detailed engineering construction drawings. It does not require stormwater uh, design, utilities, uh, roads. It, it is a zoning document which then would lead to additional steps. It does require a holding capacity analysis. So the property looks at the floodplain, wetlands, soils, and connection utilities. It's the zoning document that shows the lot layouts, the landscape buffers, open areas, recreation areas, and architectural standards. And it's reviewed based on the criteria in the land development code. The property contains approximately 67 acres of, of area that has a land use of suburban low density residential. Again, this requires the planned residential development. So anytime anyone does more than one unit per acre, it has to go through the process which was set up in the late 1980s. As part of the land use, it seeks to reduce the density in that suburban low density residential. So the, the land use seeks to get it to a density between 
and 2.5 units per acre of gross density, which is lower than what you would see in the urban part of the city. If approved, the next step would be a preliminary plat. That's a constructed drawing. So that basically has all the detailed information, the street layouts, how they're constructed, stormwater, floodplain impacts. That too is submitted to our site plan review committee, goes to the planning board for a review and recommendation, and then it comes back to the city commission for a final action. The third, the third process is a final plat. The final plat is the subdivision of land. So that is once they've done the construction, they're able to sell the land. The property already has a planned residential development zoning. So you're not seeing a zoning action tonight. You're only seeing the issuance of the development order that would approve a concept plan. The concept plan is shown on the screen. Uh, the total parcel size is 84.14 acres. The gross density would be 1.69 units per acre. So it's in that low scale of that comprehensive plan policy. If you only did the suburban low density residential area, it would be 2.12 units per acre. That would be a net density taking out the wetlands. The holding capacity analysis that was required said, if I didn't have any zoning, the site could support 2.95 units per acre. So that would be based on the wetlands, floodplains, and soils. There are uh, approximately 13 acres of wetlands on the property. The wetlands are shown on the yellow on the screen with the blue or black, whatever that color is, um, shown as the buffer. So there are direct impacts of 1.5 acres. So the fingers of the wetland here and here are proposed to be impact. So that impact both the wetland and the buffer. There are five acres of wetland buffers of which 1.24 acres would be impacted, leaving the remaining balance of 3.8 acres of buffers. The project has a school capacity issued by Lush County Schools. That's the step as they go forward into the preliminary plat they'll have additional school concurrency review. Around the perimeter of the site, there is a minimum 40 foot natural buffer area. In some areas, there's much greater than 40, but the minimum around the perimeter site is a 40 foot natural buffer area. Along Timber Creek, North Timber Creek Road, they've saved a 32 foot area, approximately 1.86 acres for the expansion of Timber Creek in the future. That would be dedicated to Lewis County. There is a sidewalk proposed from Airport Road to Leeway Trail past the property boundaries to allow access of um, any children who go to Pathways to walk to school. The property, the plan residential development requires preservation of natural areas. And these natural areas are outside the wetlands, so the wetlands can't count for that natural area. So at 20%, they're required to save 12.69 acres. They've saved 13.3. The land development code also requires recreation area, which is shown here. It's a 0.55 acre property. The project access is located on Airport Road and North Timber Creek Road. Both of these have been uh, pushed as far away from the intersection of Timber Creek Road and Airport Road as possible. There was discussion of this access point at the planning board. The, the concern or, or the limiting issue is you can't basically shove it any further north because of the wetland impacts that would occur. The lot sizes are a minimum of 80 feet by 110 feet, which was a concern in some past applications. So they are meeting the minimum lot sizes of the land development code. The project proposes fencing and a phasing plan that's within your packet. Architectural standards are also within your package that are required as part of the plan development. The area where they are seeking a variance or a waiver are architectural features along Timber Creek Road and Airport Road. This sign elevation one shows a architectural feature of 16 feet at the um, behind the right-of-way dedication located on Timber Creek Road and then they would have their actual sign in the landscape medium. Also on Airport Road they have on um, sign elevation 3 a 16 foot ent entry feature for the project. In past applications and at the planning board there were several concerns that were raised. Um, the first are the location of the two schools along Airport Road um, concerns include existing morning drop-off and vehicle stacking. So basically everyone trying to get to school. Um, the pickup issues, um, which, which are an operational issue of basically having cars there before the gates open, which are stacking along Airport Road and in the subdivision of Deer Creek. Um, the project again is installing a sidewalk to try to get their residents to, to walk to school. And there was a detailed analysis performed by Lasseter Transportation as part of the traffic study. So it gave you a pretty good schedule of how it happened. 
A second concern has always been traffic. In, in any development project, traffic is, is a huge concern. Both Timber Creek and Airport Road and east of Timber Creek are Volusia County roadways. The traffic impact analysis was provided. It was reviewed by the uh, Volusia County, City of Orange Beach, and then we hired uh, TES, uh, which Chris Walsh is a professional engineer. He's, he's here tonight in case there are any specific questions. The conclusion of that traffic study is that the, the, the signalized intersections and the roadways all met the level of service. It doesn't mean there's not going to be traffic, but both Volusia County and the City of Orange Beach have established comprehensive plan level services. So this project, including the traffic, met those level of service standards. They're also required to pay impact fees and proportionate fair share. Density was something that was talked about planning board, so we, we did some of the surrounding uh, projects, Southern Pines, their gross density of 1.9 units per acre. Pineland, under construction, is 1.22. River Oaks is 1.73. Sadler's Run is 2.34. If you look at all the subdivisions that have been done in the Western Ormian, Ormian Beach area, they're around two units per acre, not to exceed. So that suburban low density residential land use has done its job in terms of reducing the density as you get further west. Staff also looked at the number of residential uh, single family building permits within the last 10 years. The city has averaged 105 single family home building permits the last couple of years around 134, 135. That's led to an average growth, a population growth of 1.3% over a 10 year period during the census. At the planning board, there was stormwater and floodplain concerns. There was discussion of existing is issues in the areas of durance acres and unincorporated Bush County. Those areas were developed um, primarily before implementation of stormwater, and, and they don't have master stormwater systems. Um, this stage, again, is a zoning document. It doesn't have that preliminary plat construction document. It's not required at this stage. What is required is when they do go to a preliminary plat, the state of Florida and the city both have regulations of how stormwater has to be developed. It requires properties to accept the historic drainage across the property incorporated into a stormwater zone. Projects have to do that. There is a pre-development and post-development stormwater analysis required in terms of rates and volumes. A project cannot discharge more stormwater than what it did in the pre-development stage. There are calculations that are reviewed by city engineers and by St. John's engineers. The property discharges to the Tomoka River, which is an outstanding quarter waterway. So there's an additional stormwater treatment requirement. So the phosphorus and nitro remo removal are a higher level. The flood elevation study would be required with preliminary plat. Any fill in the floodplain requires compensating storage, which is why you saw the pond between Bruiser's Branch and Timber Creek. Staff has included the communications we have received, um, both at Planning Board and after City Commission. We have received um, approximately, I think, 33 emails requesting that time be dedicated to Mr. Beasley to represent property owners in the Durance uh, Acres area, and he is in attendance tonight. The planning board did recommend denial of the project by five to one, and staff is available for any questions. Thank you, Stephen. And this is a quasi-judicial public hearing. Um, Commission, I'll give you the opportunity to disclose any ex parte communications you've had on this item. Um, Please remember, in the event a member of the commission has had an ex parte communication either with the applicant or a non-applicant regarding the zoning, land use, or development order matter, please remember to disclose that uh, at this time. I think, uh, that Randy, you can help me out. That, re that includes uh, residents who live out in that area or any resident who had a concern. Okay. So if you've had any discussions or need to disclose items, we'll start with Commissioner Selby and just go down the line. This is disclosure only? Disclosure. Yeah, okay, yes. I, I've met with the applicant uh, and his consultants, and I've also uh, chatted with uh, residents about this project. I've spoken with the applicant, his consultants. Mr. Beasley called me on the phone, spoken with two planning board members, Doug Thomas and um, Gigi Galloway. I've met with the applicant and Dwight Durant. Um, I've spoken, I've gotten emails from uh, the lady that lives across from the entrance that says the lights bother her and I don't recall her name. And um, let's see, I think that's it. 
think that's it. Thank you. Commissioner Lewis. I've met on site with the developer and his consultants and several months ago with the engineers who's Dwight Durant and I've received a couple emails from residents, one being a lady um, across the way. Uh, that's what I, yeah. Thank you. And I have not uh, met with the applicant uh, nor any of the, any of the residents. So uh, at this time I have several cards Commission, if you'll recall, Mr. Beasley had spoke during audience comments at the last meeting. Uh, we did not respond to his comments, uh, but Commissioner Selby, I believe, brought it up at the end of the meeting that uh, we should decide tonight whether to give him extra time. His happens to be the first card that I have, and attached to it is a, uh, a listing of the 33 emails of people who asked uh, for permission to have him speak on his behalf. So the three minute rule, uh, it's up to us whether we waive that in any particular situation and uh, we can start with that. Oh, I'll, I'll move it, we waive it. We give him extra time. I'll second that. Is there an amount? Three times 33 is 99. I don't think he needs 99. I hope he doesn't. I the purpose of it was to consolidate and not have repetition. I had heard you say 10 minutes at the last meeting. Are you still? Me? Still oh, I didn't see that. I don't recall we saying can play 10. The tape. Yeah, you may not recall it, but you said it. Well, I may have mentioned 10, but I didn't put a limit of 10. I think that's what I heard. It was 10 minutes. Okay. Can you do it in 10? I'd like to propose 15 minutes. I'll second 15 minutes. Any discussion on that? Yep. Commissioner Kent. So I'm not saying I'm opposed to hearing from Mr. Beasley for longer than three minutes, but I am concerned about the precedence that this sets. So it concerns me about future meetings and somebody sending an email or somebody saying, hey, you know, I raised my hand, I want this person to speak for me. No, I raised my hand, I want him to speak for me as well. You know, we, we have rules for a reason in these chambers, and I'm hesitant to change those rules. If the 33 people that signed up wanted to come here and we could stay here until it was done, listen, when I first was elected 18 plus years ago, you and I had a couple of meetings until 1 a.m. in the morning. I think you probably remember those. Um, they don't run that, that long anymore but I'm, I'm, my concern is, is the precedence, and I feel like you get most of what you want to say out within three minutes anyway. Concerned about hearing the 30 minutes, you know, the 30 minute comment there, so. I'm, I'm hesitant on this one. Understood. <clears throat> well, the motion right now on the floor is 15. Any other comments or discussion? Susan, please call the vote. Commissioner Littleton? Yes. Commissioner Selby? Yes. Commissioner Kent? No. Commissioner Persis? No. Mayor Partington? Yes. Um, and Mr. Beasley, we'll start with you. They want to go first? Okay. Then we'll start with the applicant. Okay. That's fine. That takes care of any rebuttal issue. Come on up. Mayor. For the record, uh, Mark Watts with the law firm of Todd Cole, uh, 231 North Woodland Boulevard, Deland. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you this evening. Um, and uh, we've got a, a, a brief presentation to go through, um, you know, with regard to the application. And uh, I've got a, a handful of folks here I want to introduce, and, and each of them will have a piece of this that they want to want to go through as well. But um, you know, first of all, let me introduce uh, Jim and Trey uh, Paytas and, and Tom Valley. Uh, they're the the applicants really here. Uh, they're, they're local uh, home builders and developers here in Volusia County, um, and they're the ones that have, have uh, 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 the application pending. We also have Randy Hudak and Dwight Durant with Zeb Cohen and Associates as the project engineers. Um, we have uh, Bill Lights and Mallory uh, with Zeb Cohen and also uh, that are the uh, environmental consultants on the project. And then Sands Lassiter and uh, Katie Deering with Lassiter Transportation Group 
the traffic engineers with respect to the property and the project. And also, let me be remiss, the presentation and a lot of the work that's on this is one of my other fellow attorneys, Nika Husseini, who couldn't be here this evening because she's covering my other hearings in Deland tonight. So with that, we appreciate the opportunity to be here. This is fairly unique. You know, I've practiced in a lot of different jurisdictions, and the PRD, you know, zoning that you have here is fairly unique in that you have zoning but no rights, essentially, unless and until there's a development order and a development agreement that can be reached between the city and the property owner. And so that's a fairly unique situation because, really, the rights of the property are kind of held tight by the city. When we came into this, we know there's history with regard to this property, and your staff has been fantastic. I'd be remiss in not saying that from the beginning, but staff has been fantastic in saying, here are the problems that have been experienced with this property. And what Jim and Trey and Tom directed all of us to work on is to take that as a starting point. Look at all the problems that, you know, that were concerns in 2018, in 2008, and all the prior iterations of what has come back or come before this city and fix those issues. In other words, do the things the right way, exceed the minimum standards, make sure that you're doing the best possible project here to avoid the concerns that were raised with those prior cases. And so that's what we've attempted to do. I'm going to walk you through some of the kind of general outline of the project and then introduce some of our other folks to get up here and talk about some of the particular issues that came up during the planning board discussion and some of the neighborhood meetings. But let me start with that. We're in a fairly unique situation. We have to come to an agreement or you still hold tight the property rights on this property. And so, you know, obviously that creates concerns from an ownership standpoint, but, you know, our goal is to work with you to come up with, you know, the best possible development for this property, and we think we've been able to do that. So with that, let me see if this thing's on. Yeah, there we go. All right, Steve already went through a handful of these. Look at that, it's got animation. This is Nika's handiwork. Steve's already gone through a few of these, so I'm not going to belabor some of these, but, again, you've got the overall site at the intersection of Airport Road and Timber Creek. You can see this really kind of is the dividing line, and I think that's what your comp plan shows. This is kind of the dividing line between the larger rural acreage to the north and the, you know, kind of more suburban development that's on all other sides of this parcel. And so I think that's relevant when you looked at, you know, the kind of the carrying capacity and the projected densities and the densities that Steve went through with regard to what's been developed in the area. We're actually about 90 units below the carrying capacity analysis that your comp plan requires with regard to this property. And, again, that's part of that whole desire to kind of avoid some of the smaller lot discussions and everything else that were in prior iterations and focus on trying to really come in with something that meets and exceeds your standards. So we've got 84 acres, 143 lots. Net density is 2.12. The gross density is about 1.69. Again, about 90 units below what the carrying capacity shows. We do have that existing PRD zoning, so, again, we have to come to a point where we reach agreement with the city with regard to the development. And then you've already heard the detail on the existing land use. You know, again, from the outset, the goal has been to come in and not ask for something different. So the minimum lot size in the existing, you know, kind of zoning classification, the default would be that 80 by 110 feet. We've maintained that as what we show here. Prior iterations had smaller lots. That was part of the concern. We've avoided that. We've got over 44 acres of open space and active recreation and amenities, landscape areas, preserved wetland areas throughout the overall development. And then one of the things, and we'll talk more about this as we get into the overall discussion, but one of the things that we've heard is that, you know, and obviously the concerns with the school traffic and things of that nature, this is one of the closest properties to pathways in particular. And so this is the opportunity to provide, you know, pedestrian connectivity. And so we've added that not only for our project boundaries, but also beyond that to connect all the way to Leeway so that we have a pedestrian route for kids that reside within this neighborhood to access and be able to walk over to, you know, the school site. So this is the, you know, the layout. You saw this, you know, kind of in another version of it, but this is, you know, kind of the layout on the aerial. I think it gives you a really good perspective of several aspects of this. 
Um, again, you know, just some of the basic standards were exceeding uh, the code requirement for, um, you know, the uh, impervious lot. And by that mean, by that, I'm, uh, what I'm saying means we're, we're reducing that maximum impervious. I think 75 is what your code would require. We're at 70. Um, now we did, uh, we do have uh, higher lot coverage, but one of the reasons for that is we've left so much of the property in buffers. Um, so for example, where we have a 10 or a 20 foot minimum buffer requirement, we've established a minimum of 40 around all sides of the property. Um, so as a result, we're asking that uh, each of the, you know, the building lots have slightly uh, higher uh, percentage of, of building lot, you know, building coverage. But again, the overall impervious for the site is reduced below what your, your, uh, your maximum would be. And the rest of the standards, again, are, are very much in line with what um, your land development code would require. We're not seeking those anything different than that. Um, and I think one of the, the, the key points here is you've got somebody local. Uh, not just from a development standpoint, point, but from a home building standpoint, you have somebody local who's a very proven track record in Volusia County. Um, Stephen mentioned this just to give you an idea of the, the entry features. This is the you know, the median sign, and, and the um, we've asked for a waiver to increase the height for the architectural feature that you see there on the top slide. Um, that's really one of the very few uh, places where we vary in any way from what your land development regulations would otherwise require. Um, you've seen sample elevations in the staff report. Here's a few more. These are attached again to your development agreement. But the, the primary goal here is to provide high quality um, housing within uh, the city of Ormond to meet the demand that I think staff did a good job of showing that you know, there is a, a demand for new housing um, and, and a need for some additional supply. Um, and then just real quick, I wanted to mention a couple points here. You know, this is uh, the, the overall phasing plan. You see phase one is in, the is in the central portion, phase two down closer to the corner, and then phase three up in the northern portion. One of the things, and, and, and this is one place where when we went through that analysis of what were the concerns you know, before, what were the things that we needed to try and design around, one of the primary things we heard was you know, trying to, to avoid making a connection to airport road because of the concerns with pathways and the, and the school traffic and things of that nature. And so one of, um, one of the things that unfortunately we weren't able to do, and this was really a result of working with the county, the county requires the connection to both roadways. And so when we originally proposed that airport road connection as an emergency access only, so that we could honor that, you know, that request and that, that um, idea of moving forward, what we had to do with regard to getting the approval of the county to connect to their to the two roads that they own and maintain in that area was provide that as a connection point to airport road so uh, sands lasseter is here we'll talk a little bit more about that as, as we move forward but that connection point um, we initially tried to keep as a limited connection point but um, we had to tie in the other thing that um, stephen mentioned briefly about the connection to timber creek um, the county does have a minimum separation that we have to make so we have to meet a minimum separation from the intersection to be able to have that connection point. And then we have the, the Gruber Branch, you know, uh, wetland system here along the, the kind of northeastern edge that keeps us from being able to move it any further north. So, uh, you know, the, the lady that we spoke with at, at both um, the neighborhood meeting and the planning commission had the concerns about, you know, the um, headlights and things of that nature. I think Dwight will speak to that uh, briefly when we talk about the engineering. But um, we are, are really, no matter what happens with this property, that's a fixed point because we have that separation requirement from the intersection and we have the constraint of the wetland area to the north of it. So with that, I believe I'm gonna ask Bill to come up uh, and talk to you a little bit about wetlands and, um, and um, some of those other points. Thank you. Hello, my name is Bill Lights. I'm with Zeb Cohen and Associates. I'm an environmental director and I've been doing wetland delineations for since 1989, about 33 years. Um, have probably, I calculated it recently, have delineated about 700 miles of wetlands throughout the southeast and central Florida and had to all of those reviewed and approved by the Water Management District or Florida Department of Environmental Protection. So um, the wetlands on site are as shown right here, we have already delineated them and um, had them reviewed by the Water Management District. Uh, after the review, there's 14.43 acres of wetlands instead of the 13 that was originally uh, submitted in the application. Um, we have uh, done a 
a little cross section. There's actually a lot more relief on this project than you would think it is, that there is. Uh, it is not all wet like the public thinks it is um, and has uh, shown or expressed in the public meetings. The site goes from about 10 feet on Groover Branch up to about, I think it's 25 feet over on the west side. And this cross section just gives kind of an example of uh, how much drop there is between Groover Branch when you go up slope to the, the bulk of the, the wet uh, uplands in the middle of the site. And then there's a perched wetland over on the west side, the, uh, the wetland number two. And then we'll have a little bit more development on the west side of that and then a buffer adjacent to the city owned property. So there's a lot of fall for the engineers to um, capture the stormwater, treat it, and uh, before they discharge it. This is what people see, I think, from Airport Road and from Timber Creek Road, why they think maybe there's so much wetland on the site. The marsh on Airport Road is this view, and it's impounded, and it does have a lot of water, and I'll show you a slide later as to how much water it has shown uh, that it holds over the years. Groover Branch runs through the site from the uh, northeast to the southeast corner and discharges out into the um, development that was done prior to stormwater regulations that's uh, now still in the county. And you can see on the, um, I don't know if this has a pointer, but on the Groover Branch, you can see that tree over on the right side with the lichens on it. And right now it's kind of at a low level and it only, inundates about three feet up and down. That's about how much Groover Branch um, fluctuates. And we're not going to impact Groover Branch or any of the wetlands associated with it. So um, there's no chance that we're going to block any of the drainage that comes from upstream. In order to just express how many uplands there are out there, uh, since the public and most of the commission um, hasn't been on say we took photographs up the field road uh, in the middle of the site and there's a lot of vegetation that grows on this site that will not grow in a wetland so the the sand pine is shown on the left up there that's at the point about midway up the field road between the two wetlands there's also some southern red cedar they won't grow in wetlands and as we progress up, we just see more and more upland species that just won't grow in wetlands, uh, proving that this is the extent of wetlands are shown in the, the ghosted in hatch pattern instead of uh, the whole site being wetlands. So Southern Magnolia grow in the uplands only, and American Holly also grows in the uplands. Longleaf Pine will only grow in the uplands, and that's further up the way. And then we also have uh, some myrtle oak, which is a scrub species, will not grow in wetlands. So we just wanted to document that um, the real wetland lines are shown in that blue. Those are approved by the Water Management District. There are no other wetlands out there. The Water Management District has the final say on what wetlands are and what wetlands aren't. And there are 14.4 acres of wetlands on this site, no more, no less. And then we have a bunch of uh, live oak also, and they won't grow in wetlands. This is the, the graphic I was going to show that just shows the inundation over time. And we just went back through Google Earth, and you can just see the areas in yellow are the areas that pretty much stay inundated over the years. I guess giving the impression that the whole site is wetlands, but it's not. So I'm going to turn it over to the engineer now to talk about floodplain. <clears throat> Good evening, Commissioners, Mayor. Um, my name is uh, Dwight Durant. I'm president of Zeppelin Associates and got billed by two years. I've been doing this for 35 years here in, in Ormond Beach. Uh, Steve actually had a very good um, cursor there on engineering, so I won't go over that. Um, but I do want to say before we started with this project, the Paytas uh, team had instructed us from an engineering standpoint to meet or exceed code, exceed code if we could in all instances. And although we're not supposed to do that at this stage, uh, we couldn't help it, we did it anyway. We went ahead and did all of our stormwater calculations, so 
the plans that you see are really not zoning documents. They can be turned into final engineering plans at, the, at, at a later time. Um, and the reason we did that, because we wanted to be able to look you in the face and look the, uh, uh, the adjacent property owners in the face as well, because this is where they live and we do not want to impact them any more than you want us to. Um, so we went through that extra uh, effort. Uh, I want to talk to you about two things. First is the floodplain. Um, that's, that's one of the hardest things to understand, I think, from a layman standpoint. Um, so we put up a map here. This is FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Association. It's a federal agency that delineates the floodplains. They do this from Virginia, so it's not always tremendously accurate, but it's where we start. There's a base flood elevation of 19 on the site. <clears throat> what you see there in the, in the blue is what they consider the floodplain, and uh, we have to respect that when we go through our design. Uh, if we impact it in any way, we have to compensate for it. So how does that floodplain plane work on the site? Uh, you can see the shaded area. Uh, that is superimposed on the layout that we have. As you can see, some of the lots encroach on that. Most of the floodplain, it is a volumetric issue. It's not an area, so it looks somewhat imposing. If you look at the 19 contour, it's actually the crosshatch area, not the shaded area. So what we do is we look and calculate what kind of impact that would be with our development. Again, it's not a zoning document, so we went ahead and did it and we figured out what the compensated, what the impact would be for compensating storage. So on the other side, we took some lots out uh, on the uh, north uh, east corner of the site and we turned it into compensating storage area. We, we documented the volume that we needed to mitigate the impact and that's what we have. The other thing is and from a flowway standpoint, even though it's not a floodway, we consider from an engineering standpoint, we consider that and in no way, shape or form will we propose to block the drainage that is coming from the north down to the south all the way to the Tomoka River. So it's a 3D thing, it's not a, it's not a two dimensional um, item. Um, I want to talk a little bit about storm drainage. It's completely independent from the compensating storage, but they both have you know, similar characteristics. We've got five stormwater ponds that we've designed on the site. Uh, this area drains not only the water that hits on the site, but also uh, from adjacent properties. The city owns the property to the west. We will make sure, uh, as Steve indicated, we're required, and we will. We've already studied it, and we'll make sure that any drainage that comes onto the site from the off-site properties will be accommodated. It will be put in our system or be routed around, and the same from the Durance Acres to the north. It comes through Groover's Branch. We've got to make sure that we maintain This site uh, drains to the Tomoka River as a result. It's an outstanding Florida waterway and it's an impaired water body. Therefore, both of those requirements uh, impose requirements on us to increase our stormwater above and beyond a normal uh, development. Uh, we're aware of that. We went ahead and showed what it would take. And as a result of some of the holding capacity analysis and that kind of thing, uh, we reduced our density. We reduced our number of lots uh, because we had to provide uh, additional stormwater. Uh, we're at about, we're a little over 20% of stormwater right now. Typically a development of this take would be about 15% of the site or of the developed area. Um, we've studied the drainage basin all the way from US-1 uh, down through the site to the Tomoka River. I've personally walked it all, uh, all through the Forge property, uh, Ormond Crossings, uh, the developments that we're doing on US-1. Uh, so we know where all the drainage is going. We'll prove that later, but we wanted to prove it internally uh, that we could address all those things. Um, one of the other items that was kind of brought up was the uh, flooding that occurs on Airport Road. Um, I think I understand what is happening there. The uh, wetlands that Bill had identified, they don't have outfall right now. And so what happens when we have a greater than uh, normal event, it builds up and it floods over the curb and it goes into their uh, inlet and then to Grover's Branch. It really doesn't pose any real issue, but it's not a great option. And uh, at the end of the day, as an engineer that will be signing off on this, we won't have that. Um, so there is a, there's a benefit for, for development, uh, which I'll show a little bit in the next slide, but we can fix that and we will. we will. We will take that water, we'll provide a positive outfall, we'll run it through our system and treat it, or we'll, we'll uh, bypass it and put it in Grover's branch, but it won't adversely impact or for road anymore. This is kind of a graphic that um, 
we put together as, as the, on the heels of the uh, planning meeting uh, just to, to try to illustrate some uh, how development works and, and maybe arrest some of the fears that were out there. Uh, this is a map that if you take a look at it, it, it generally identifies uh, most of the developments um, by their uh, common name and as they were approved. So the blue is, are developments that occurred post stormwater regulation requirements. In other words, they have retention areas, they have drainage structures, they have curb and gutters, they have pipes, they have the things that us engineers put in the infrastructure when the, when the um, development occurs. The yellow was pre, and, and this is probably about 1980, pre um, uh, stormwater regulations. And you can see the Durance Acres was one of it, it was in the county. Uh, there's not a whole lot of drainage structure out there. When I mean structure, I'm talking about um, uh, conveyance systems, collection systems, retention and re detention systems. Uh, the blue has it. And then if you look to kind of the southeast uh, of our site, uh, the same thing. Uh, those were all developed prior to the regulations. So I sympathize that there are some drainage issues there, but it's not, a, a, it's not a result of, obviously, development of our site. We haven't developed. And it's not a development of all the blue areas either. They all, you can see the retention areas in there. They've all done that. And I would s submit to you that those are not areas that have drainage issues. The areas that have drainage issues are the yellow. So what we're asking is to, for us to turn our red area into one of the blue areas and along the way help the drainage out there. And I know there will be questions. I'd like the opportunity to answer those as it relates to engineering. And one other thing on the, um, on the lights. There's engineering things we can do. It's not all location. We can adjust angles horizontally and vertically with the vehicles as they leave the site to mitigate any, any light of So we've done that before, and we would obviously do that here. And I'd like to turn it over to Sands or Katie for traffic. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Sands Lasler, president of LTG, our offices are 1450 West Granada and our owner Beach. <clears throat> I've been practicing in this business for about 43 years, uh, here for the last 20 seven or so, um, and uh, we've done a standard traffic study, even though I don't think it's required at the zoning level, we wanted to go ahead and provide that information, and as was said earlier um, by Steve, um, we've had, uh, Ted's has reviewed it, uh, Chris Walsh, uh, he and I reviewed each uh, other studies over the years, and we both know how you do it and what you're supposed to do, and we do it the right way. We sign and seal these reports, making sure that we're showing that we're following state standards. And I understand that's not totally the issue. The issues here have to do with the fact we have a school operating on Airport Road. Uh, one thing we've done in this plan, which I really do like, is having the alternate out uh, flow of traffic out to uh, Timber Creek Road. And that allows us to minimize our impact to um, Airport Road when the school's going in session, out of session. We absolutely understand that's an issue and it's one that uh, we feel that we tried to address in this. So I just wanted to kind of make that up front. Also, we've noted that the school board actually owns the lot west of the school. And there may be an opportunity for them to consider some sort of stacking opportunity over there, which is something we do from time to time. We're on continuing service contract with Volusia County Schools to help them mitigate existing problems and help them design new schools to avoid this in the future. But uh, uh, the points we've raised here are pretty important. We're setting aside 32 feet of right away for the eventual widening of Timber Creek. We understand that Ormond Crossings is north of this site. Ormond Crossings is meant to be a future residential, but also an employment center for the city. Um, we're uh, looking at a zoning that allows 234 homes. We're actually proposing just 143. Um, as I said earlier, uh, we've got the alternate access, so we're not putting all of our traffic out on Airport Road. In fact, we'll probably see most of it shift to Timber Creek uh, when those peak periods are happening at the school. Uh, the primary impact of school is about 30 minutes long, but when you sit at a light for a minute to a minute and a half, 30 minutes seems like a long time. So I certainly understand that. My wife a school was a school teacher. She retired. I've done a lot of study around schools, so I know I know the issues and the concerns. 
uh, but providing housing near schools helps reduce uh, travel. Uh, it actually provides an opportunity for a safe walk zone. Uh, when you're walking for miles, and in this county, a two-mile walk zone is, uh, is allowed. Uh, this uh, obviously reduces that and provides for a safer environment. Uh, obviously, the project is going to generate the road impact fees uh, that, uh, in our opinion, go beyond just probable prop share cost. We haven't come to that estimation yet. But those impact fees, we would, I think, would be great to target those, not just give them to the county to put in their general coffers, but to target those fees for the widening of Timber Creek between Peruvian and Airport. We think that would be uh, a great uh, benefit to the city and to the public, as well as to the county, for that matter. Uh, and that's really it for my presentation, but I'll be around for any questions. Okay, with, with that, um, um, I think we've, we've tried to go through and make sure that we were addressing not only the, the comments that we, we received um, both at the, at the neighborhood meeting but also at the, the, during the course of the planning board. Um, so, so I think, again, you've, you've seen those comments in your staff report. I think staff did a good job of giving you that summary. Um, you know, we, we have gone through and, and done the, the traffic analysis. The conclusion, you know, that, that has to follow the, the TPO guidelines with regard to how that's conducted. Uh, the conclusion is, you know, despite the fact that, yes, there are times of, of congestion, um, it meets the, the level of standard uh, service standards that are adopted by, by both your comprehensive plan and the county's. Um, Dwight's given you uh, his, his uh, kind of summary on the floodplain and, and stormwater issues. We, we've kind of gone far beyond what's typically required at the zoning stage to make sure that we understand the issues and are confident um, that we're, we're not only um, not creating a problem here, but solving some of the problems that are in the area um, as we move forward with the design. Um, reducing the overall impervious and instituting that modern stormwater system. Um, school capacity, um, you know, we, we aren't done testing that. You have to test that at each phase as you move forward with platting. Um, but uh, the preliminary school capacity analysis that the school board provides to us based on the unit count uh, came back that they have capacity to provide you know, school uh, stations excuse me, student stations um, for the, the future residents of the, of the property. Um, and, you know, with regard to the wetlands, I think, um, you know, one of the things that I think is, is kind of hard to see, and, and Dwight, you kind of mentioned it, when you see that, you know, kind of overall kind of shading area, that's, you know, the, the generalized FEMA map that's created from, from uh, Virginia. But I think, Dwight, you, you mentioned that the cross-hatched area is actually where that contour line is shown on here. So we, we went beyond kind of looking at a LIDAR or, or you know, an aerial and saying we, we estimate the line to be here. We've identified where that, that flood uh, line is on the property, and that's the area that's shown here with that cross hatching. Um, and so that's what we've designed and, and planned based on, uh, and we'll continue to have to do that as we go through the engineering review that comes forward. Um, and then again, uh, just uh, with regard to wetlands, I, I think one of the things that is unique about this site is those wetland areas are adjacent to the roadways uh, in the area. So as you're driving past the site, that's what you see. Um, but as uh, you know, I think we tried to very intentionally get Bill out onto the property and give you those pictures from specific points inside so you can see the internal portions of the property are actually very different than what you see on the edges in some of those locations. So um, with that, um, you know, just to, to kind of summarize, you know, our, our, our mission from our client standpoint was um, go out and exceed the standards that the city has and, and resolve the issues that were with the, the prior uh, iterations of the uh, proposal on this property. So we've, we've come in with a lower density. We've come in with larger lots um, than, than really are, exist in the area already. If you go to the adjacent areas over off Leeway, I think some of those are 50s and 60 foot lots. Um, so, you know, going with an 80-foot lot uh, as the minimum that's all otherwise required under the straight zoning, um, we think, you know, kind of responds to that, that general comment. Um, your staff has concluded both before and after uh, the Planning Commission discussion that it's consistent with the comprehensive plan um, and meets your standards um, from the Land Development Code standpoint. Um, we're exceeding uh, the vast majority of those standards, again, the buffering, the um, recreational amenities, common open space, all are in excess of what your code requires. Um, and I've, I've already touched on, on traffic and, and the other uh, elements of the you know, land development code. Um, as I said at the outset, you know, this is fairly unique. You know, we have zoning, we have no ability to do anything with it. Um, so we, we ultimately have to come to a resolution with you as the, the city that's currently holding those property rights back. 
Um, we ask that you support the, the staff recommendation of, of approval. Um, our team is here to, to answer any questions. And Mr. Mayor, if I could just offer an apology, I jumped up you know, prematurely at the, at the very beginning here because that was how they, we, we kind of handled the discussion at the planning board, so I didn't mean to offend anybody if I did that. But uh, that was kind of the, 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 the way the meeting was, uh, was run at the planning board. So um, with that, uh, if I can reserve any time to come back up and answer any other questions that you may have now or that may come up after the uh, um, uh, general discussion from the public. Thank you. <coughs> Cards and first I have David Jewell. Good evening. Thanks for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm David Jewell. I live at 2040 Tony Street, directly across the airport road where the wet wetlands empty on the airport road. In 347 BC. Aristotle wrote, water seeks its own level. A social metaphor today, it actually has to do with hydroscience. My son-in-law is a licensed surveyor and he suggested I shoot some grades with my transit. I found out my property to be 28 and a quarter inches below airport road sidewalk. That's directly across from my property. Right, that's my property and that's a side path. It's 26 and an eighth of an inch below airport road at the curb. The new project, by bringing in 18 inches of fill to rise it above airport road to meet building requirements, renders my property 44 and one eighth inch below their grade. And I'm not going to get any water. There are many legal cases on record dealing with new developments and flooding problems. The general consensus is that municipalities issuing permits for new development that cause harm to adjoining property may be held financially responsible. On December 22nd of 2021, at 12.15, I received a, uh, received a phone call from Stephen Spracker. We met on Airport Road behind my home. Mr. Spracker was there to investigate a report from me of heavy equipment operating on the Tattersall site. It turned out to be a contractor hired to clean up the survey for the survey crew. During our conversation, Mr. Spracker explained to me that I live in unincorporated Volusia County. If I have drainage problems or flooding, I should contact Volusia County. Tattersall is in Ormond Beach and we aren't concerned about unincorporated Volusia County, not a Norman Beach problem, he told me. At that point, I realized how little the Ormond Beach Planning Department was concerned about my property. Are the retention ponds they're building on Tattersall for them or for me? I have some personal observations in closing I'd like to make a point. We have three groups at this meeting tonight. First we have homeowners and residents concerned about how this project will affect them and their families. Increased traffic, possible flooding, etc. Second, we have you, the commission, elected by the people to protect its residents and provide a safe community for us to live in. Thank you, David. Next Third, is we Janine have these guys. Holmes. They're in it for the money. Janine Thank Holmes. You. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Janine Holmes. I live at 319 North Timber Creek Road in Ormond Beach right directly across from the new subdivision, supposedly. The lady that complained about the lights is my neighbor, and we've discussed this. And right now, there's really a lot of traffic on that road because of the schools. And if that entrance, exit, whatever you want to call it, is across from us, it's going to be miserable. My husband's disabled, and if I have to get out quick, I'm not going to be able to because there's going to be so much traffic on that road. Also, the flooding. We have 
a creek in the back of our house. And that creek, will, and when there's a lot of rain, it comes up to about 25 foot before my dog kind of in the back. Um, I hate to complain. I wasn't here at the last meeting. But I think you need to think about this really good. Because we've been there for 50 years. And, you know, all of a sudden we got this thing. We moved out there to be away from that. And now we're going to have a subdivision across from us. That one to the north. Let them go someplace else. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Jim Moza. Jim Mozo, 74 Palladium Drive, Ormond. Uh, Sunday night, or excuse me, Saturday night, Sunday morning, we received, according to my rain gauge, three quarters of an inch of rain. Today I went by uh, Airport Road and Timber Creek. I saw two spots that were flooded. The west side on Airport Road flooded over 100 yards back. I couldn't tell how much on Timber Creek, and it wasn't Hoover Cross uh, Branch. That was a little pathway into the woods, and it was under the water. That's since Sunday morning, and it hadn't gone down. Two, I'm curious if uh, stormwater and the flooding codes have been updated lately. Because if they haven't, we're going to have a problem with this uh, climate change. Well, what we had five or ten years ago is not going to work. One other question. Uh, I was curious about subsurface rights. Is that issue been approached? Who owns the subsurface rights to that area? I'd hate to see somebody buy a house or a lot. And somebody come in five years later. Hey, we want to dig in. We're going to go look for gold. We're going to, it sounds crazy, but we're going to look for something. And if they have those subsurface rights, subsurface rights, the property owners might be in a little bit of trouble. Thank you very much. Thank you. Missy Herrera. Missy Herrera, I live at 111 North St. Andrews. Um, I'm here, I don't live in this area. I live, um, I may live in Orange Beach, but I don't live directly in the affected area for this development, but I was at a county council meeting and I heard a young man speak, um, and I talked about this at the planning board as well, who lives in Deland, and they've lived on, in this area along with several other residents for generations on dry land. And um, Victoria Hills and Sawyer's Landing and several other developments have been developed around that property. Um, as a result, um, those, when those developments were developed, they um, built up the land. So some of it was wetlands, but some of it was just low land. And, um, and I talked to him at length. He told me that his property and the surrounding properties in his, of, his res, of his neighbors were 76 to 81 feet above sea level. Um, they filled in some wet and low land. They basically built it up. And it, they built it up to 81 feet to 93 feet for the new neighborhood. Um, what they did is they, in addition to building up the land, they built retention ponds, and the retention ponds aren't lined. So what happens is there's basically an increase in the hydraulic effect, so it pushes all of the water down into their, into their properties. So it started showing up as just puddles on their properties, and now there's almost 100 acres underwater. So these are existing residents who, you know, these developments are big and successful, but they affected the people that were already living there. So I just wanted to encourage you guys to really, um, Dwight did a great job. I couldn't tell if you took out the lots that were on the wetlands um, from what you put up there or not, because I think there were four or five and there's plans that are going to go put those out, yeah. So, but just to think about the, how the water is going to affect the existing neighbors who, you know, they, we sat for three hours at the planning board meeting hearing them tell about the flooding that they're having. So things might meet all of the code, but I think it's really important to take into consideration how it's going to affect the of other properties. So, anyway, um, the one guy, he 
there's been over 150 um, dumps with scratch proof dirt and the other people have horses, they can't graze them anymore because their pastures are underwater. So yeah, I think it's really important to think about and then even research that development and see how it affected them. So lining the ponds was a big thing. It didn't happen over there, so I don't know if it's part of your plan, but the retention ponds, if they're not lined, it's just going to drain down to the lower lower lining property. So just what I've learned from wasting hours at night researching things. So thanks for your time. Mr. Beasley is next, and Commission, he has three slide PowerPoint that he'd like to show during his presentation. So she is going to put 15 minutes on the clock. And does anyone have any objection to him uh, having the clerk show those PowerPoint slides? Uh, Clay Beasley, 2180 Arabian Trail. Thanks for giving me the time to speak. I want to thank um, uh, Stephen over here. He was very professional and, and very helpful. Um, I'm a 62-year resident of Ormond Beach. My wife and I have lived in Durance Acres for 39 of the 43 years we've been married. I'm going to skip a lot of the other stuff. Uh, when we first bought out there, we, you had to buy in like 20 acre parcels and you could subdivide to 10 and then now we're currently at 5. Durance Acres is a very unique property out there. And, and how it's positioned. And Stephen's right, we didn't have any flood plans out there when we built out there. There was no roads, leeway wasn't there, no side roads, airport road west wasn't there, pathway schools, none of that was out there. So that's how come it all happened like that. But having said that, um, I wanna get right to some of the, to the problems because I don't have a lot of time. First, traffic. Um, a lot of the uh, my neighbors out there wanted me to talk about traffic and length. But I think in reality, um, we know we can't do nothing about the schools. They have a unique way of uh, doing whatever they want to do, whether it messes up everybody's day or not. But having, but having said that, though, we talk about trying to four-lane the road from like Peruvian to um, Airport Road. That's not even on the five-year Volusia County plan at all. So talking about that or discussing that is just, it's, it's pie in the sky, it's not gonna happen. Uh, the county is a big county, it has big problems, and we are a very small part of their big problems. We think we're a big problem, but we're really we're not. So let's get into the reason that I always speak, and it's about flooding. And just for quickly one second, um, I want to speak on behalf of the city of Ormond Beach, because I don't see anybody here representing the city. And what I mean by that is, is that property um, that is behind their property over here, and by the way, it's not their property. Mr. Spino still owns it, as far as I can tell. The Enclave Group still owns this piece of property as far as on the uh, Volusia Property Tax Assessor's um, website. So Mr. Spino still owns the property. I think they're probably going to purchase it and get this thing to go through. But having said that, all of the property that that water tower sits on sits in water. When they line those houses on the westerly side of this property from one end to the other, it is going to become a dam. Now, they can talk about how they're going to get it. I guess they could ditch, dig a ditch down and send it down to the end and try to get it to go over Crover Creek. That may work, too. But at the end of the day, this is where these problems start. Where if Stephen can... I apologize. I don't know how to work this thing. I got it. Thank you. Looking at this property right there, we see the wetlands that are showed on their property. That's our ditch. That's what that exactly is. All that property out there, Endurance Acres, behind that leads to it. The property... Can I use the, uh, I do not know how to work yours, but I bought my own. So right there where this property comes through there, you can see what happens. It comes right to their property and goes down and heads down to the river. That's a good depiction of what actually happens with a lot of, of, um, of, of force when it comes through there. But all this property out in this area out here where Durance is flows into this and comes across. When we, when we let uh, Deer Creek build right here, because this property used to take and come this way and down, and, and uh, drain this way, it dammed all this water up this way, right through here. And Leeway Trail, in five or six or even seven spots, water just flows across the road constantly when it rains out there. Drops in on the city's property and goes across this way, across all of this where they're gonna put these houses across here. It's impossible to line that much houses across that property right there and expect for it to go somewhere. Now, I sit currently at about 25-foot base. They mentioned that their base is 19. 
which means I'm somewhere between five and six feet above them. We know which way it goes. I'm a state certified plumber, water well contractor, and also a state certified um, septic contractor. I know how to get the water out of the ground, in the ground, and I know which way it flows across the ground, and it's gonna flow to them. This is like an hourglass is what this property is. I'm not against building whatsoever. I make a living with it. I'm, uh, we've never, we came to these meetings since 2006, 2012, 2018, and I hear them talk about we've got such a better plan right here. We went from 163 lots in 2018 to 144, now we're at 143. You gotta ask yourself, how come we got bigger lots, but we got the same number of lots? Well, that's a good, that's a good question, because we mysteriously lost 13 acres of wetlands. During all this time, from 2006 to 2018, we had 26 acres of wetlands, but we no longer have that. So, did everybody read this? This is an interesting piece of information. It speaks about delineation, which is basically looking at trees. If you look on the property, you can find something that grows kind of high. But they never talked, they talked about having soils that were down 20 to 40 inches to where the water table is in wet times and 40 plus in the wet, in, in, in the, I mean the dry season versus the wet times. You can do a perk test on that property anywhere with a pulse toll digger and you'll be lucky if you can get down more than five to 10 inches and not hit the water table. How do I know that? Well, the property on the Ormond side sits in water all the time. Water has to flow. They said that water flows across their property. It flows under the ground as well as on top of the ground. And so that's a problem. Um, speaking back a little bit more, I don't think anybody ever really came in here and was really concerned about the buffer zones and, and um, preservation. Um, whether it's a 20 foot buffer or a 40 foot buffer, you only gotta go up the road another half mile and you see houses on both sides of the roads. And frankly, I like looking in the back of the houses when I'm going by, to see what I can see in the windows. It goes like that. So I do not get what the big deal is with these buffers and fencing and all that stuff. That's not what this is about. This is about flooding us. I feel sorry for the people out in our, I don't flood personally at my house at all. I'm high and dry. But the damage that was done from Deer's Creek, Deer Creek, Hunter's Ridge, to push the water and coming down leeway is what we're discussing here. It is the only thing we're discussing here. Also, this property works as a little bit of a staging area to slow water down. If we start taking and allowing them, now they talk about these bigger lots, but they're also bigger houses and roads. That's, you can't get water to flow through con uh, asphalt and concrete. They put it in these areas and it goes into the ditch and it heads right down towards all these people in Timber Creek. Now, whether they're in the city of Ormond or not, they still flood. To put that kind of water that fast, taking this piece of property, which is so vital, this is a vital piece of property. Now that doesn't even take into consideration, you guys are already up here talking about uh, Ormond's Crossings. Well, guess what? Ormond's Crossing is up behind that as well. Uh, Ormond's Crossing's water comes that way. It flows naturally that way. And that is something that is, 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 is a very big deal. <clears throat> Mr. Spino, by the way, it was mentioned that you know, we've got in-town people now at the, at the planning board. We have in-town people now, and we feel a little bit better about this plan. They have skin in the game is one of the things. None of these gentlemen over here live out where I live, and none of them live downstream as well. And Mr. Spino was a very nice guy. I had multiple conversations with him over the years. He's trying to get us to change our mind about what's going on out there. I met him at my shop one time. He brought me oatmeal cookies. He said it was his grandmother's recipe, but I think she worked at Publix. But <laughs> one of the problems that I see this also is, is if you read this, um, this um, environmental assessment here, it also mentions in here that it has not been approved. It has not been reviewed by the St. John's Water Man Management District, um, the Environment Protection Agency, and neither the Army Corps engineers. They haven't approved none of this. This plan has just been something that they put together in order to try to get rid of 13 acres of wetlands. And I think they're vital 13 acres of wetlands. I agree that there's some high portions on this property. The first um, 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 30 some odd or 40 some odd acres that they bought on the um, south side of their property, the first piece, when they started off with 68 lots, nobody even showed up to even say anything about that. It didn't really affect the wetlands that we're looking at up there. It didn't have anything to do with that at all. They want to develop this. There's probably some way that they could develop that junk 
and leave the wetlands, the marshes, which, by the way, I, I have to commend them for changing this from marsh side to Tattersall. Marsh side did describe it a lot better. But that end of that property on the north side right there needs to be left alone. Also on the right back in here, you see that little area right there, that little dark area right there? That's on city property. Water flows through that across Leeway Trail with just a half inch of rain because unfortunately that land right there in that, in that triangle is where the water sets because we built all this up in here with uh, Deer Creek. And it sets there. Somebody Can somebody explain to me how we're going to get water out of that area across all these houses at the way that it flows into Grover Creek and down through and all the way down to the river? It's impossible. It can't be done. Um, do I have a lot more time? No, oh, jeez. I got out of, I got out of line a little bit. I'm sorry. It pushed me. I had this thing in the mirror at home for about 30, 35 minutes. Out where we live out there, we don't ask for much. We have private drives. Uh, we maintain our own roads. Um, we do not have city water. We do not have city sewer, nor do we want it. Um, our residents pay tax just like everybody else. Um, we do have trash pickup. But we have homes that have good values out there too, from 200000 to a million dollars. So it's a, it's a nice area to live. We are probably one of the city's best retention areas for water to go back into the ground. We don't really have what would be considered a, a, an area that all of our lands out there sit in flooding. We have a problem when the water gets heavy rains and it has to move somewhere and it moves into Grover Creek and comes across their property over there. That's all we're asking is for you guys not to pass this under its form. You can't put the toothpaste back in the bottle letting this thing go like that. There's a reason why this was turned down in 2012, 2018, and here we are again. And so I, I, I hope that we can actually take and um, turn this thing down, make them go back and redo this to where they can stay out of those floodplains, flood areas. Okay? Thank you. Rebuttal now, and then the commission will kick around any questions and have some discussion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, just a, just a couple of points. Um, I'm going to ask Dwight to, to come back up to speak you know, directly to the, the um, some of the specific stormwater uh, comments that were made and flooding comments that were made. Um, again, I, I just want to emphasize, and this goes back to um, Stephen's presentation of where we are in this process. Um, we're at the, the zoning stage. Uh, we have a maximum of 143 lots that are identified and part, as part of our current plan and as part of that zoning document. All of that is subject to change as we go through engineering. Um, you know, that's the next step. Uh, the next step is that you have to engineer the site. You have to fully engineer the site. Dwight, you know, we'll talk to this in a second. But, um, you know, we talked about the fact that, that uh, we, we know a lot more than you typically do at the zoning stage, and so we can say things here with confidence because we've gone, gone that extra mile, done that extra uh, review. But the bottom line is that engineering, that extra detail comes back to the planning commission, comes back to you, goes to water management district. And so at the end of the day, we may ultimately you know, lose additional lots as we go through to make sure that we're engineering because our obligation from a legal standpoint is to make sure we don't have any effect on the folks that are here speaking about the stormwater issue. We are legally required to continue accepting the water that flows onto the property, and we are legally prohibited from increasing the rate by which that water flows off to any of the adjacent properties. And so our obligation, and Dwight, this probably, I'll, I'll keep going if, 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 I, if I don't pull you up here, um, our obligation is um, to, to not create those additional stormwater. And I'll, I'll speak to the, the one example in just a second in the land but I wanted to get Dwight to talk specifically here, um, and then I'm going to give you a little bit more background on that one, because that, that, it, that situation there is very distinct, but it's being used as a, as a kind of example around the county right now when it applies in a specific situation there. So, Dwight. No, I appreciate the process. Um, we, we have a process intact to go through this and hear these items. Um, be glad to meet with any of these folks and walk their property. I, uh, again, I'll tell you, I, I've walked 
this property at least a dozen times since this project started. I've been up and down Leeway Trail. Um, I'm the guy with the motorcycle and the dirt bike that, that goes through all of these properties to, to try to figure all this out. I sympathize with this. Uh, these people live here. Um, they need to have assurance that whatever we do is not going to impact them. We're not here to impact. We're here to mitigate. We're here to fix things, leave things better when, when we found them to, to where we leave them. Uh, that's my goal. I've been doing it for 35 years. I don't think I've been called out on anything to this point. I'm not about to start here. Uh, that said, uh, with respect to Mr. Jewell, we don't drain on to his property, and we won't at the end. We all we will drain internally and then put it to our outfall, which is the Rivers Branch. We have a great outfall. Most sites don't have this. Uh, we will certainly take care of that, and we will make sure that any sites that we connect up to that are adjacent to will also enjoy that, out, that outfall. We will extend it out to the property lines to allow things to drain. They do not drain now. They, they're completely right about the things that they're seeing and they're experiencing. Uh, I ask you to give me the opportunity to go get those permits to make things better uh, at the end of the day. Um, Mr. Beasley was correct in the things that he's saying. Those are the things that I've seen out there as well. Uh, the only thing that's incorrect was the word impossible. That's not true. Give us engineers enough money and we'll fix pretty much anything. Uh, there is water that goes across the site. We have to address that every single project that we do. I'm accustomed to doing that. We will calculate. I've already met and discussed it with the city uh, because they own, uh, you guys own the, the property next door. We have to make it better when we're done. Uh, so the process that we go through after this with the water management district is the things that Mr. Beasley mentioned we will do. We won't do perk tests. Those are for septic tanks. We'll do permeability studies. Uh, we'll do soil borings. There'll be no less than 24 or 2,000 soil borings done on this site to figure out where the water table is exactly, uh, what their permeability rates are, how it goes into the soil, how it comes out of the soil. We have to mimic that. We have to demonstrate to the water management district that we're rehydrating the wetlands. We just can't take the water and, and throw it downstream. We have to hold it. We have retention systems, detention systems, filtration systems. We'll have uh, uh, infrastructure to handle all that stuff. But I can't go do that until we get approval here and then we move on to the preliminary plat to be able to demonstrate those plans. You all know me. We have uh, our office as an open door. I'll be glad to meet with any of these people, explain it to them. We've, we've tackled some of the very difficult sites in the city of Ormond Beach and in the county and have, and have made them better. This is one of those that we can do. Uh, all I ask is the, the opportunity to do that. Thank you. I think I think that covered the um, the points that you know Sands I think addressed the, the questions with regard to traffic. And again, we all experience that, particularly around school sites. Um, we we think that again from the, from the standpoint of <coughs> your comp plan, the county comp plan, we're meeting the standards. Um, the the comment was raised about you know the. the I guess Mr. Beasley raised the comment about you know the impact fees not staying in the area and, and, and just not necessarily being on the county's radar. You know, one of the things you know just to, to make sure you know, everybody here is clear that when you when you have an impact fee and, and uh, you know the county's impact fee is set up this way, you have zones, and so your your impact fees that are paid have to stay within the zone that they're paid in. Um, so the, the zone here you know is the northeast quadrant of the county. That's a big area, but we have successfully. In, in you know, Williamson Boulevard is a great example. When we started working in LPDA, we worked with the county and the city to make sure that the money from the development projects there went to the road network in here. That was largely in our prop share. But that is a possibility, and it is a requirement that when you have impacts in an area, the impact fees and the proportionate share dollars that are uh, generated by those projects have to go into the area that are impacted by the traffic that, are, that you know, is being generated. Um, that said, we meet the standards in the we meet the standards of per currency and the comprehensive plan. Um, the last thing I, I, I mentioned, I, you know, I, I, I'm friends with and, and the customer of the, the gentleman in, in the land that, that has the house. That you know, and, and they've got a neighborhood that has a lot of different issues. Um, their issues are, you know, they, they were constructed in an area that historically was kind of a forested wetland. It had gone through a very dry period at the time they were permitted. It was exacerbated by a poor design for a stormwater pond that went along side of their properties that was not locked. And so it does create some water coming out. It's a 
very specific issue in a very specific location. Um, but I've heard that that example in a lot of different jurisdictions now as you know, flooding, you know, all development causes flood. And that's simply not the case. I think if you think back to the, the, the blue versus yellow areas of the city that, that Dwight identified in the map in our presentation, you can see the benefits of a modern stormwater system and how we have to meet the requirements that are in place that, uh, today. Um, last point I'll make, I, I know that the environmental assessment, there was a reference to that, that, that you know, was a, a assessment we had have, we have prepared, but not one that had gone through and been approved by everybody else. The wetlands that are on the site that we have showed you have been certified by the water management district. They have come on site and walked those same lines and confirmed they agree with the location of those lines. They agree with the extent of those wetland areas. So again, our goal has been to look at the prior examples of what was being proposed here and correct the, you know, the things that have caused concern. We hope we've done that. Our team's here to answer any other questions you may have. But we ask you to support the staff recommendation here. Let us continue moving forward, working with you and the residents in the area to make sure the development of this property, which again, we have to come to agreement to do that because you have the rights in your hands. Um, let us make sure that, that we can do it in a way that doesn't create concerns. That's our goal. So uh, thank you for your time this evening and we're here to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. <coughs> Commission, uh, let's take a five minute restroom break and then we'll start back. We're adjourned for five minutes.
Move approval of the ordinance amended to disallow the non-code uh, architectural renderings. Uh, is there a second to that? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand the motion. There's one part of this that's they're asking for a variance, which is for the 16-foot architectural renderings. I am not approving anything not to code, so that's why I made the motion as I did. Ms. Mayor? Yes, sir. Um, I'm not sure I was paying attention, so I'm not sure I fully understand the nature of the motion. It would be appropriate to get a motion for approval on the floor for discussion purposes. And if you want to make any motions to amend, then you can treat it as amendments, if that would be helpful. If you're ready at that point to do that. I will withdraw my motion and I'll make a motion for approval. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded for discussion purposes and uh, Commissioner Lewis on discussion. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, as I met with <coughs> the developer and his staff, I'll tell you guys exactly what I told them. I wouldn't approve anything, or I wouldn't approve what was coming before us right now. I would approve the project being built to code. That's because this is a unique property. I want full transparency. Every T crossed, every I dotted. None of the funny shenanigans that happened the last time the project came before us, which was with a different developer. And so that's what I'm supporting here tonight. If we're going to allow development on this particular unique piece of property that has to be the code. No special treatment given the same rights for the developer as anyone else sitting in this room. So that's what I'm supporting. Uh, Mayor, I have a question, uh, maybe for Mr. Spraker. Um, Stephen, the waivers, you started to tell us about the waivers, and you mentioned the first one, which I think Commissioner Middleton just mentioned, that the entry features are 16 feet tall, and I believe our code only allows them to be 8 feet tall, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. So our code really doesn't have a, a section for entry features. So the default is basically the monument sign, which is a maximum of 8 feet. Though it's not something that's it's not expressly allowed in our code, it could be done through a plan development, but again, that's the commission's decision if, if you believe that to be appropriate. Okay, are there any other waivers that they're asking for? No, sir. Okay, so the the building coverage is not a waiver? De plan developments are allowed to establish their development standards. So, you know, they are actually, uh, for the maximum impervious, they're at 70%. Land development code allows 75 in every other zoning district. So plan developments are allowed to establish how that development is, is to be built. That would not be a waiver. Is there a distinction between impervious and building, impervious coverage versus building coverage? So our land development code has one for, for lot coverage for, for the building, and total impervious includes the building, uh, driveways, other, yes. other hard surface areas. Right. Okay. And so, so, so I thought in their presentation that they wanted 75 per, 75 versus 70. Am I mistaken? They're, they're asking for 70 percent. 70 percent. Okay. So which is 75. which is less than what our code allows. Less, less total. Oh, okay, 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 okay. So the only waiver, then the only thing that is not in keeping with the code, is the height of the two entry features. Correct. Okay. Well, I, I, me personally, I don't have a problem with that. Because I saw them and I think they're very attractive. I think they'd be, I think they'd be a plus to the community. I think that's. I don't see that as. But, but I hear your point. I understand your point, Commissioner Wilton. Okay. Thank
Thank you for the clarification. Any further questions for discussion on the motion to approve? Well, I, you know, look, I'll, I'll go ahead, sir. I mean, I'll, um, first of all, this is an infill site. It's an excellent infill site. It's developed all around it as opposed to building further out west or somewhere else. So that, that's one reason to, to uh, approve this. I believe that Groover Branch will be improved by this project. I think the flow in that, in the, in Groover Branch will be improved. Um, I'm, I, you know, I've heard all this discussion. I've heard all the discussion about the sheet flow, the, you know, the groundwater flowing from the west across the city's property onto this property. We've been assured by the, um, and most of these comments, by the way, have really have nothing to do with the, you know, with the, what we're dealing with right now because we don't have the full engineering that comes at the next step. But nonetheless, they're all topics that are being, and I believe that, I believe that uh, sheet flow water will be uh, handled appropriately. And, and I think it could actually improve the, the flooding that the uh, Durance Acres people are experiencing. And remember that, that they don't, they have no stormwater system at all. They have no formal storm stormwater system. So they're just sort of at the mercy of how the water naturally flows. There is no man-made uh, system that helps to move that water off of their property. Um, the lot sizes, I, 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 I'm especially um, pleased that they're 80 by 110 with a 40-foot buffer all around the entire perimeter of the property. So that's a huge benefit. Uh, there's one property, there is only one private property owner that directly abuts this property, and it's to the north. And that property owner supports the project. Okay, he supported it. He's, he's the only property owner that directly abuts it, and he supports it. And Groover, Groover Branch runs through his property. Um, uh, the developer is the builder, and that's big in my mind because Paytas Homes has a great reputation. They build beautiful homes, and they really don't want to be the developer, but they need more lots to build on, and so they've, they've decided to become the developer to create lots so that they can build homes. And I like that because uh, I kn we know that they're going to build a, a high-quality product there. And just in case you're not aware, the, uh, the estimate right now is that the homes will sell between five hundred dollars and $600,000 each. So these are going to be nice homes that are going to add uh, to the tax base. Um, they're going to put the sidewalk in along Airport Road, and they're going to extend it ac not only across their property, but across the city's property so that it'll be safe to, uh, for kids to get over to uh, Pathways Elementary. And, uh, and by the way, people living where they can walk to the school is a plus because then you don't have cars picking the, picking the kids up and they don't have to ride, well, obviously they wouldn't ride a bus. The uh, donation of the right of way, the 32 feet, the entire length of the property along um, Timber Creek Road. I also believe that to be a huge plus. We, the city, has estimated the 234 homes, the capacity of that property. They're only proposing 143 homes. That's 39 percent less than what the capacity is there. Um, the out parcel. There was a lot of discussion the last time this came up about that piece in the northeast corner on Timber Creek Road. That's going to be a for lack of a better word, it's going to be a gigantic pond. It'll be a huge lake. There will be no homes built up there. And that is compensating storage for the area that they fill um, that's in the, uh, the floodplain. Um, phase one, it's a three-phase project. Phase one, in phase one, they build both entrances and they build the common area. They build the recreation element. And I think that's a big plus. So that all gets done very early on in the process. The neighbor to the east on Timber Creek Road complained about potential of headlights shining into her house. Um, the engineers have assured me that they have a way to create a little dip in the road so when the cars come out, 
the headlights are actually shining down and then as they make the corner they don't shine into the home across the street they've also offered to plant a hedge there on that on that person's property if they would like that also um, they're going to pay five hundred thousand dollars in impact fees that's huge also and so for I mean, honestly when i read the pack when i read the when I read the package on this, I was looking for reasons to turn this down. It really was. I, I, I was looking for reasons to turn this project down, and I can't find any. I can't find any. So I'm in support of it because of that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Kent? No, excuse me, ma'am. You're out of order. Commissioner Kent, sit down. You're out of order. Commissioner Kent. Staff, do, do we know who owns the property right now? Does Mr. Spino still own this property? The reason I ask that is, is during my meeting with the developer and the engineers, they hesitated when I asked that question. They gave me a woman's name, and then I heard someone tonight say Mr. Spino still owns the property. It, it's not going to change where I'm going with this, but I heard a commissioner earlier say, mentioned the word shenanigans didn't want to have any of that so let's just get it all out now who owns the property right now property is owned by Marsha Madorsky care of Timber Sky LLC and the Enclave of Timber Creek LLC I'm not aware if Mr. Spino is a owner or not within those two LLC but those, those are the property owners. okay and that's I believe the woman's name that they mentioned whenever I asked uh, during that, that Zoom meeting that, that we had. Um, and the other reason I, I didn't know, I wasn't so sure that they owned it, owned it, was I worked at Pathways. I had the pleasure of working there for 14 years. And it wasn't um, an every month occasion. It wasn't every six months. Sometimes you might, you might go over a year. But the optics, and I shared this with the group, but the optics of that property, when you're on Timber Creek Road and you hang a left towards Pathways and you're heading west, after a heavy rain, water comes over that curb and drains into the storm drain for like sometimes three, four days after the rain is done. So. It, it looks, the optics make it look like it's a swimming pool and uh, not a good place to build anything. And, I, and the comment I, I, I agreed with was to change the name from Marshside to, to Tattersall uh, was, was a good move. And I had an opportunity uh, yesterday to meet with um, the engineering company and for the property and I'm really glad that I did because it is a lot higher than I thought it was and when you're driving on Timber Creek Road and Airport Road it looks like it's a swimming pool it's it looks wet and the topography map is a powerful map to show the the dips and the rises and the elevation um, but Mr. Spraker, I, I need I need you or Mr. Finley, somebody to come up to talk about the comment I heard about the water coming across the road to the west, over to the city property, and then over into this property, which eventually goes to Gruber's um, Creek. How is that going to be addressed as far as that? the water on the surface coming across and now there's homes right there so it goes onto the city property where the water tower is and then boom there's those homes right there how is how is that addressed how does staff approve this with okay. that problem can we go back to our powerpoint presentation so i can just work on that so again this is the zoning aspect of the development so, I, I, so I know it is I, just, but they went there and i'm appreciative yeah. you did i think it was a good move right. so with site development, what they'll have to show is what water flows onto the property today. 
whether it comes from the west, the north, whatever direction. So we're going to get calculations of how the water is flowing today. In our observations, this wetland in Deer Creek doesn't have an outfall. So that's why you're seeing the water overflowing onto Leeway across the city property and then making it to Groover Branch. May not be heavy rain, but when you get a heavy rain, that wetland has no place to go. So there are opportunities to manage that so it doesn't go across the road, which is not, which is not good for the road. So potentially to manage that, to, to give it a path to get into either their stormwater system or into Groover Branch. That stormwater plan, which is designed by professional engineers, will be reviewed by city professional engineers and the St. John's River Water Management District. So all those groups are taking a look at, at what the historic flow is and then basically how they're going to hold it. There are state and city regulations. They have to accept it. They can't discharge you know, more than they discharge today. Do you know off the top of your head, go back to your little pointer of the water flowing over the road of Leeway, that property right there. Yep. The map that they showed, was that a yellow or was that a blue? Do you know what I mean? Like the yellow, I believe the yellow was was uh, prior to St. John. Deer Creek has a, a stormwater management plan. But the water overflows and goes across Leeway Trail and they have a stormwater management plan? Yes, sir. How does that happen? Like to me, that's terrible optics. And I give all these residents are screaming and yelling because if there's a stormwater plan for Deer Creek and you're telling me that it overflows and runs across Leeway Trail onto the city property and we're not kicking and screaming because we don't have any residents or we don't have any buildings there. Is it too much for me to ask? How does Joyce, how does that happen? Like that's that's no good. The plan is approved by St. John's River Water Management District, and I understand that the Deer Creek is required to file a report every two years with St. John's to demonstrate that they have met those stormwater requirements. Um, I'm not aware that St. John's actually actively reviews those, but I just don't know the answer to that. Right, and I appreciate that because, and I believe, I believe this group when they say, listen, by law, we can't let any of the water from our property negatively impact anybody else. And we have a plan. And we're going to bring this water here, and it's going to move down here over to Groover Branch and out to Mocha River. We're all good to go. But didn't they have a plan? Like, they had a plan approved by St. John's River Water Management. And then these guys have to deal with the, those negative effects. Like, it seems to me like somebody failed. There was a, there's a definite failure, and, and somebody failed. So I, I'm, after I went to the property yesterday and, of course, reviewed and read all of this, I I'm, was leaning way more towards Commissioner Selby and saying, you, you know, um, this is going to help with the situation. But now it's got me scratching my head, and I'm sure the answer is going to be that piece of property, which we're not talking about tonight, but really we're talking about all of it because it all affects the other. That piece of property doesn't have a way to Groover Branch right next to it. Groover Branch is in this property, so it has a way to it, is, is I'm assuming what, what the answer is going to be. Um, Mr. Mayor, I may have some more questions before I vote on this, but um, that one has me uh, scratching, scratching my head a little bit. And whenever you all come back up and talk, if you can address that issue, um, and because I think it's a valid, very valid point. Deputy Mayor Persons. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is this is a real a real tough decision. I think um, first of all, but I do want to compliment Mr. Beasley and all the people that signed the. Uh, you know the petition of, about they let him talk speak for them I think that was wonderful um, I think the developer and the attorneys and Dwight Durant and everybody over there has done a fabulous job explaining everything um, I guess the, what I'm really my concerns and I haven't heard this at all tonight 
would be the environmental impacts on the animals, um, the birds, the, the little little things that live out there in those in those wetlands. And if you build something, it's just gone. Where are they going to go? I mean, I know there's there's other places up there, but we're taking away all of that in our city, and that concerns me somewhat. Um, I, I think that there's some negative impacts to adjoining property and neighbors have concerns and I am the zone three commissioner and I have listened and I've heard everyone and I and I understand the concerns. So um, I've seen the flooding. I've driven back and forth like Commissioner Kent just said that that road floods. It's 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 an iffy if it's an iffy area and I, I don't know that I'm totally convinced that it could be fixed. Um, maybe I can be, but I'm not really sure if I if I am. The traffic is an issue. I was the principal at Pine Trail Elementary, and um, it's it's gotten worse since I was the principal there. Um, much much worse. Um, I go about once a week to pick up my grandson on early release Wednesdays, and people talk about kids riding their bikes and walking. But I will tell you that bike rack, there's no bikes there. None of the kids ride their bikes like we like we think. Um, it's not safe. Parents are worried about their kids. It's a different world today. So most kids don't ride their bikes to school. Their parents want to drive them to school and they want to pick them up to make sure that they're safe. So those are my concerns. And I will, I may have some questions for these folks over here, but I just wanted to throw that out there right now. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. <clears throat> and uh, at this point, I'm a no on the motion to approve this item. Um, I agree it's a tortured piece of property. It's had its difficulty over the last 14 or 15 years trying to get some kind of approvals. I believe in 2006 I voted to approve the uh, 68 parcel proposal. and when this thing came back to us after we had dealt with Marshside, I thought, oh, what are we going to hear that's improved since Marshside was denied? Surely there are some big improvements out there that are going to sway me that I can finally support this. I thought maybe I'd hear less density. It didn't have to be 68. I mean, maybe that was a little low when I voted for that 14 or 15 years ago. Uh, but it came in at, at 143 one less than where Marshside was. So that to me doesn't really equate to less density. <clears throat> and then I thought, well, maybe we'll hear that there's gonna be some improvements with the traffic situation. Uh, that there's gonna be some improvements to the intersection out there at Timber Creek and Airport Road or uh, Volusia County's finally gonna do what they should have done in the first place and four lane from Lipizan all the way to Airport Road. Uh, but we didn't, we didn't hear that, so I was disappointed on the traffic issue. And uh, so I, you know, based on the planning board's denial, five to one, as well as uh, all the testimony here tonight, I believe there's substantial competent evidence to support a vote of denial on this project. And recognizing it's just a, it's a tough piece of property that can't handle the density that they're trying to jam in there. I think with less density, the project could actually work, um, but I don't see that. And the testimony tonight from Mr. Beasley, you know, representing 33 people, he provided all those emails uh, from, from all those different individuals, maybe more people, 33 property owners, some, some husband and wife, so maybe more people when you, when you calculate it that way. Um, <clears throat> So that's just what I've heard tonight, why I can't vote to support this. Um, I know the adjacent property owner was against the Marshside project, but he said he would support this because it's the least worst that he had seen. But he did want a wall on the northern side of the property. I don't know if that's included in the staff recommendation or what's up for approval, but uh, just a reminder that he did request that. And the other troubling thing I saw during the uh, presentation was the FEMA flood zone. And I thought, who would buy in a FEMA flood zone? And then even worse, who would sell somebody a home in a FEMA flood zone? That's disturbing to me. 
Um, you know, I can't protect every future potential Ormond Beach resident, but uh, it disturbs me that somebody would sell a home in a flood zone. Uh, and so that just makes me question that particular issue. So commission, um, we're at the point where we've heard all the testimony and evidence. We had the opportunity to, uh, to vote now unless anyone else has any further uh, questions or discussion. I'll just say, since the motion hasn't been amended by anything, I'm a no vote because it's not the code. Call the question. So just for the record, the motion on the floor is to approve. So if you want to approve, you vote yes. If you want to deny, then you vote no. Understood. Thank you, Randy. Uh, with that, please call the vote. Commissioner Kent. No. Commissioner Persis? No. Commissioner Littleton? No. Commissioner Selby? Yes. Mayor Partington? No. 8C. Ordinance number 2022-02. Ordinance number 2022-02, an ordinance amending paragraph C, official zoning map of section 2-01 established of Article 1, establishment of zoning districts and the official zoning map of Chapter 2, District and General Regulations of the City of Ormond Beach Land Development Code, by amending the official zoning map to rezone a certain parcel of real property totaling approximately 2.00 acres located at 215 Williamson Boulevard, Volusia County, parcel number 4230, dash zero zero dash zero zero dash zero zero one four from B dash eight commercial to planned business development PBD authorizing revision of official zoning map repealing all inconsistent ordinances or parts thereof and setting forth an effective date. This is the first reading of ordinance number 2022-02 read by title only. Thank you Susan. I'll ask Stephen Spraker to speak on this item. This is a request for both a zoning map amendment and a development order uh, to the planned business development. The property is located on Williamson Boulevard, located here on the map. Ormond Town Square is located um, to the south. There are commercial uses located across the land to the south would be in the city of Daytona Beach. The uh, project is seeking to go from the BA zoning district to the planned business development zoning district. Uh, there are Part of the site plan, the applicant broke it into five uh, sections. The first section uh, currently has a stormwater retention pond. They would propose to, to move the stormwater pond to parcel or section five and create an out parcel here. Section two would be cleaned up, a fountain would be placed there. The parking field would be uh, available for the uses within the plan development, as would the existing building in area of parcel four. So there's basically a reconfiguration of the existing property. There are three requests as part of this plan of business development. The first is to allow the pylon sign to stay and to be renovated. Uh, they could keep the pylon sign as a non-conforming sign and just change the features, but they are seeking to uh, redevelop it, refurbish it in order to provide visibility to this unique parcel. The second is to have a building height on areas three and four of 50 feet. The existing building is 50 feet in height. The existing zoning allows 30 feet. So there's an inconsistency between those two factors. And the last request is to allow a series of uses, uh, some on uh, parcels three and four, and then the out parcel would maintain the P8 and would include a pharmacy use. The planning board recommended approval six to zero, and staff has also recommended approval. Thank you, Stephen. Any questions for Stephen? Deputy Mayor Persis and then Commissioner Kent. Uh, what, I'm not sure if I'm asking the right question at the right time, but it, do we know what would go in the different parcels? So the applicant has not identified that to staff. Okay. So 
the, the users would provide the menu choices, so they would be able to do any of those, and basically those users would be reviewed and approved by the site management. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I've got one card from Paul Holo. questions for Paul at this time? Deputy Mayor Persons. Yeah. Um, good evening, Paul. Thank you for being here. Um, this is a prime piece of property, you know, right there on Williamson, you know, just right there. And um, I just would like to let you know that I, I've talked to a lot of folks about, about this area, and they would just like to see something go in there that everybody could use, like a nice restaurant or, you know, just something nice for Ormond Beach, something that we would all be proud of. And and I've, you know, like I said, I've talked to a lot of people, and you know, there's all kinds of rumors, and I won't even get into that about what could go there, etc. But you've done so many nice things for our city, and I just, you know, would just, you know, get hope that you would just continue that, and you know, not put something that not everybody could enjoy or visit. We certainly are, are seeking out. We like to eat Norman. <laughs> we do. <laughs> Any other questions for Paul? I've got two cards for 8D. Uh, Julie Ufel and Missy Herrera. Was it C or D that you wanted? C? Okay. We'll start with Missy Herrera.
me out with a pronunciation. Ufel. That's all the cards I have. Uh, motion for discussion. Motion to approve for discussion. Is there a second? A second motion. And a second. Commissioner Kim. Yeah. So just a couple things from uh, some of the comments that, that I've heard tonight. So I, I've lived here my whole life, and I didn't, I've never referred to Williams as downtown, ever. So I think that's a, not just a stretch, but like totally inaccurate. Downtown's like right behind me, right here. That's our downtown. Williamson's not the downtown. The other thing that I find interesting <laughs> is people that don't own the property want to tell the person that bought the property the list of approved things they can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't, we don't want you to do this or this or this or this. You know what kind of restaurant you'd have to put there to make any, that thing is huge. That property is like crazy huge. And by the way, if you blink, you miss it because the ingress egress is so small right there. And then it, it like it goes back and feeds into this nice huge area. It's a perfect area for boats and RVs. Where did U-Haul come from? I, I don't know. but. It, it, it's a perfect area for boats and RVs. You blink and you miss it. I don't know that he's going to do that. I have no idea. But whoever owns it, if it's Mr. Hollow or Miss Loman or whoever, Mr. Jones, they're going to put whatever they could probably make money at. And one thing I know about the Hollows and the Lomans, I'm saying it because you're here, they don't make things look worse. 
I'm going to bring it up because someone from the audience brought up about the confrontation with the Wawa. Places like crazy, wildly successful. I love filling my boat up with it because they have non-ethanol fuel right there. I don't have to drive to Daytona to get non-ethanol fuel. And some of those naysayers, I've seen them there filling up with gas or getting a little Sammy. And that's okay. I'm pleased about it. I'm glad they do. But if I were the one putting the money up, the audacity of somebody going to tell me what I need to put on there from the approved list. It's the approved list. It's approved. That's what approved means. Approved list. Put what you want on there. But Mr. Hollow, I have a question for you. So if you come back to the podium, it just blows my mind. This 50 foot thing, like, do you have to have 50 foot? Like, what's that about? The, that's just the current, bu the current building height is right. uh, 30, but the actual building is 49.9 feet. Right, yeah, I read it in the staff report. It was, it was, it was 50 foot. Yeah. And um, when I read through the staff, you know, the staff report, I saw that. But I was just thinking, like, whatever you put there, like, what would you need to be 50 foot? Like, I can't think of anything that you would need. And you don't have to disclose that. But is that a sticking spot with you? Does it have, do we have to approve 50 foot? It, it is uh, part of our request. And we feel that for the future redevelopment, it's integral. It would not apply to the out parcel. Uh, we, we, the out parcel would remain under the current height limits, but it would to the basic theater building. Right. And, and on the issue of uh, outdoor storage, covered storage, um, it, it's not, if that was, uh, it's, it's more of a, a placeholder for us. It was something that we had uh, hired a consultant did a, from Orlando that did a study for East Volusia County. It is needed in, in, in our area, uh, but I think that the city is going to be very pleased with what we bring back to you in short months for the redevelopment of this property. And um, again, the out parcel would not have a 50 foot height limit. It would have the current VA uh, height limit of right. 30, I believe. Uh, but the 50 is uh, integral to getting this property redeveloped. Right. Um, uh, the, the theater building may or may um, stay in its current configuration and be uh, repurposed um, with, with additional buildings. Unfortunately, I can't disclose tonight, but um, I don't think we'll be talking about boat storage in a couple months. Gotcha. Um, and, and the only reason I would even entertain that is if you were in the downtown, if, you, if this was real, you know, I mean, if that was a real scenario, which it wasn't, but if it was real, like right behind us, we wouldn't be talking about allowing, you know, 50 foot, you know, right there. But like I said, you can drive by and, and blink and miss this. And, and I know because before the internet and your phones, I used to actually drive by and read what was playing at the Regal. And you had to pay attention because you'd miss it really quickly. That's very true. Yeah. It was my son's favorite movie theater, by the way. We could always get in no matter what was playing right away. So anyway, sad to see that part go, but, but I understand it. I have no more questions, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner. Yes. Yes, I'm actually ecstatic that this parcel is being redeveloped so quickly. I mean, having an abandoned movie theater in Ormond Beach would be such an eyesore. It would almost be like the old food line. Um, I definitely support this. I can't wait to see what goes there. It's a hard piece of property to redevelop, and I'm glad it's being done by Mr. Hollow. Thank you, Commissioner. Anyone else? Um, I support this. It comes with a six to nothing planning board recommendation. Uh, boat storage doesn't bother me because it strikes me as a very low intensity use. If I was, <clears throat> you know, we had a piece of property behind my house that was looking at being turned into homes and there was another option of maybe somebody turning that into boat storage, I would have been a lot more comfortable with the boat storage, just people coming and going to get their boat on the weekends. Uh, versus having actual houses behind my house. Uh, so I get it, you know, when you're talking about the intensity of things. But, yeah, this is a unique property. I mean, centrally located, 
geographically, kind of in the heart of the city. It's unique, uh, special, so I don't think you're going to have trouble finding uh, uses for it. And um, I'm, like Commissioner Littleton said, I'm just glad that it's not going to be uh, abandoned or, or continue to be neglected for any length of time. So unless there's any further discussion, please call the board. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Commissioner Littleton? Yes. Commissioner Selby? Yes. Commissioner Kent? Yes. Mayor Partington? Yes. And that was the zoning, and now we're going to the PBD, if I understand correctly, and that'll be 8D. Ordinance number 2022-03, an ordinance authorizing the execution and issuance of a development order for a planned business development to be located at 215 Williamson Boulevard to be known as the Regal Center, authorizing an out parcel along Williamson Boulevard, allowing a dash additional users and creating a framework for future redevelopment, establishing conditions and expirations of approval and setting forth an effective date. This is the first reading of ordinance number 2022-03, read by title only. Thank you. And Stephen, did you want to Say anything else about this? Good deal. Move approval. Second. Any other discussion? Please call the vote. Commissioner Littleton? Yes. Commissioner Selby? Yes. Commissioner Kent? Yes. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Mayor Partington? Yes, and we'll move to 9A. Resolution number 2022-18, a resolution of the City Commission of the City of Ormond Beach, Florida, approving the preliminary plat for the cupola at Oceanside, a planned residential development subdivision, establishing conditions and expiration date of approval and setting forth an effective date. This is resolution number 2022-18, read by title only. Thank you. I don't have any cards. And we'll start briefly with Stephen Spraker, Planning Director. This property is at 100 North Halifax. It was previously approved for planned residential development. Uh, the next step, as we've learned from the first item, is a preliminary plat. They have an approved site plan. They're under construction. Staff is recommending approval, and the planning board also recommends approval. Thank you. I don't have any cards. Any questions for Stephen? Just need a motion. Mayor would like to move a resolution 2022-18. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Please call the vote. Commissioner Selby. Yes. Commissioner Kent. Yes. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Commissioner Littleton? Yes. Mayor Partington? Yes. And Nancy, I didn't want to deprive you of the right to speak, but thank you for being here, just in case. Very well. All right, we will start uh, reports, suggestions, and requests. And tonight we start with City Manager Joy Shannon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll just call your attention to your uh, future workshop schedule. February 15th, we will be talking about Casson Park. March 22nd, Parks and Rec Master Plan, and then uh, the remaining list is on there. So I don't have anything further unless you have questions for me. Any questions for the city manager? Sure, I would like her to talk about uh, the McDonald Pass. <laughs> Thank you. I'll turn that over to Sean Finley who can update you on that. Delegating. <laughs> Uh, uh, just an update on where we're at. Yeah. We have gone through a final inspection with, with the contract with A.M. Weigel. We have gotten through everything here except for that last little bit of landscaping. And so we're going to try and do as much as we can to landscape it. There's two different ways we were looking at doing it. One was simple sodding, which I think would do a good job for them because they're looking to use that area that's to the west of the building kind of as a festival lawn with tents as they do some of their um, fundraising activities. They've kind of given us an indication they'd like a little bit more, so we're going to try and see what we can do to get some, get some, you know, to, to do it, to do it right and and do something as pretty on the outside as, as the rest of the building. But um, we've gotten a lot of good feedback from it. Um, it is essentially ready to go, and we'll, we'll finish off. The last piece that we have is our echo sign that'll go on the front. That, that's, I'm sorry, the budget. We are well under budget. That's one of the things that we're most proud of here is that um, by taking it like we did. You know, doing it in the phase approach. This was a this was a little bit different project than, than any other projects we've ever done, and hopefully we'll ever do again. Um, we took it piece by piece, and, and we've worked with a good partner in A.M. Weigel, who helped us to see to see some some of the opportunities. Um, all all told, we're about two 
two-thirds of what our original budget was that we did for that, for our total that we did. Um, I think we were good that we were the high bidder when we got that, that, that grant because it gave us the most money from, from that, at least the kind that we were able to get from that. And um, I appreciate everything, all your support in helping us to do this project because um, it took us all a little while to become believers, but I think that by the time we got to the point where we were making that turn onto that, that Granada side of the building, the light came on for a lot of us, myself included, that this was a this was a definite enhancement for the Granada corridor and um, something we should all be proud of. Thank you, Sean. And I know the Historical Society has uh, big plans for the inside. We're excited about that as well. When you couple that with what's going on with the Ormo Memorial Art Museum, the amazing improvements there, uh, the new publics, there's just all kinds of great things happening in our uh, downtown here in Ormond Beach. So appreciate that. Any other questions for the city manager? Thank you, Joyce. Assistant city manager, Claire Whitley. Thank you, Claire. And city attorney, Randy Hayes. No, sir. Thank you. Good night. All right. And tonight we start with Deputy Mayor Persis. Good. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm glad you all are still out there. I just have a few comments tonight. Um, first of all, I just have to recognize Nancy Loman being here. Um, great, a wonderful development that's going to, going to be the cupola, and I think we're all going to love how it's going to look. I, I, and I just know we were, we're, we are. So congratulations for making that area. It's going to look great for making OMAM look the way it is. I know you have a huge hand in that, too. So just want to personally thank you and I know everybody else feels the same way so but it is looking good and I can't wait till it opens this is going to be fabulous absolutely fabulous and um, I was able to attend the groundbreaking at the South Orman Nova Center that for the gymnasium it's going to be wonderful I know so many kids and parents and families are going to get to enjoy that facility and so I just want to just say how excited excited I am and others are too and with that, I'll say good night. Everyone be safe. Thank you. And uh, Commissioner Little. Thank you, Mayor. I'll only touch on what uh, Commissioner Persis said, in which when we were at that groundbreaking, Commissioner Bohm pointed out that a new gym hadn't been built in Ormond Beach in like decades, I mean, a long time. And now, because of this commission, we have a new place uh, to play basketball and other such pro activities. Um, it's going to be nice. Uh, and with that, I'll say good night. Thank you. Commissioner, Commissioner Selby. Thank you, Mayor. Um, a couple of quick topics. One, you, uh, regarding the first step shelter, homeless shelter, you all received the annual report. Pretty, a lot of, a lot of very interesting information in that. I wanted to just highlight a couple of items in there. Nearly 60% of the residents use psychiatric medications and have diagnoses such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, PTSD, and major depression. So this, is a, this is a very challenging population. And then relative to uh, successes, the, um, the shelter has provided shelter, food, clothing, and case management services to 240 people. That's in the, in the immediate, uh, in 2000 and I'm sorry, 2021, who are experiencing homelessness, and which is 85 more than the year prior, and even in light of the pandemic, because it's, you know, it's congregal living, so we had to be very careful about bringing anybody in who, who might be uh, infected. And uh, during the year, the shelter served 49,275 meals um, in the shelter itself, and then another 4,984 meals in the safe zone. So over 50,000 meals uh, during the year. Um, and then relative to uh, just services that were provided, 188 residents received in, uh, income help, meaning you know they're able to uh, secure some kind of income for them, with 48 being employed and another 140 receiving disability or social security income. Health insurance, 136 residents received Medicare, Medicaid, or other insurance, and 120 uh, were eligible for and are now receiving food stamps. So I think, you know, in 
the, the first step shelter frequently gets a, uh, a bad rap, but it really is helping to change the trajectory of an awful lot of people. Um, uh, just getting, um, I was looking for the number of people that are in housing. Well, it's uh, over a hundred. Over a hundred people have been put into permanent housing, so that's a that's huge. And then uh, relative to Ormond Main Street, um, there's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, Granada Grand is Saturday, February 5th, and it'll be on uh, New Britain, you know, between Beach Street and uh, Little Ridgewood. Uh, the Taste of Ormond is with, with, that's where it was last year also. Taste of Ormond is Sunday, March 6th, and the Celtic Festival is Saturday and Sunday, April 23rd and 24th. And both the uh, Taste of Ormond and the Celtic Festival will be in Rockefeller Gardens. Uh, also, Main Street is going to, uh, with the suggestion of um, Brian Rademacher, our economic development director, is going to uh, do a photo contest to encourage people to uh, submit photos of people and activities in the downtown so they can build up their, their database of, um, and also build interest in the downtown uh, photography so they can use that in future promotions. And Julia Trulio is retiring. So uh, that's a big loss because she has really been uh, a real powerhouse in the downtown. And the board has committed to do a, uh, a, a, a well, I don't know if it's a nationwide search, but they're going to do a, a major search to replace, uh, replace Julia. And with that, I'll say good night. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Ken. Yes. About five years ago, I was approached by some members of the Ormond Orm Memorial Art Museum. and. Um, also their executive director about the addition that is just about finished and I just am pleased to report I had a hard hat tour today from 4 to 5 p.m. and uh, I was able to uh, walk into every room and the uh, tree lined area the observation deck and what a special treat uh, for, for Ormond Beach I'm so pleased that's in uh, in zone two so um, it's, it's gorgeous there's going to be, there is a wonderful space for their educational piece with uh, young art students and also older art students. So uh, with that, have a good night. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Commissioner Selby, you've done a yeoman's job on the uh, shelter board, and thank you for your service on that. I don't think people realize the, the time commitment and the amount of amount of work you have the heart for it and we're lucky to have you uh, having performed that service I looked at the numbers uh, for Warman Beach and I see for 2021 we had four shelter intakes there were 20 safe zone referrals but only four of those actually uh, went in I guess to the program Daytona Beach had 2477 safe zone referrals and 118 shelter intakes but I think Ormond Beach is one of the largest contributors maybe 75,000 or somewhere in that range every year and I am continually assessing whether we're getting the bang for our buck certainly when you look at Daytona Holly Hill even Port Orange and the shores to some extent uh, the referrals that they're making are making the overall area better uh, but yet as Mr. Sargent indicated earlier you still see quite a bit of evidence of the homeless in our community so we can't make people go there uh, but I'm hoping maybe staff can come up with a better plan to get people there I realize it's a touchy issue but to have four people in a year get into the shelter as an intake that doesn't even say how long they stay or, or what happens with them but that's pretty pricey uh, for seventy five eighty thousand dollars so uh, I think it's time we start to take a look at that maybe as part of next year's budget process and see what we can do to uh, to figure out exactly what's going on and maybe improve uh, what we're doing for our
our residents along those lines. The Starry Starry Night this last Friday night was incredible in cooperation with uh, the Art Museum, the Historical Society, and the Casements. Uh, there's art shows. There was an artist at the Casements, and it's just a great opportunity to walk that downtown area and enjoy some of the amenities that, that Ormond Beach offers and it was well attended and I wanted to, to thank everybody for, for putting that on. Beautiful evening, great music and uh, each of those organizations, whether it's Casements or Historical Society at the Mac House or OMOM, they're so excited about what they do for our city and their volunteers are so passionate about Ormond Beach, it's just, it's uh, it's wonderful to see, and so I want to thank them for that. The Martin Luther King Jr. drive through yesterday was uh, extremely successful. I think they gave out over a hundred and something uh, breakfasts, and then also had a flyer with the MLK Jr. history on there, and a summation of uh, his many accomplishments, and just the passion that people have to make sure that that day is recognized will blow you away. The sense of community when you're there with uh, Ormond Beach residents, Daytona Beach residents, Holly Hill residents, whoever comes out for that. But really, uh, Tina Carlisle is a driving force behind that. She's on the volunteer committee. Uh, a bunch of people help her. Joe Daniels, one of our greats, was also there. And, uh, you know, seeing the enjoyment that everyone has coming together to, to celebrate a person who stood for for peace and, and uh, caring for all was a, just a heartwarming experience, made you feel good about, about the community. Uh, the cupola is going to be fantastic. I feel like I could be the sales agent for that place <laughs> if you uh, free. I wouldn't charge anybody, but I mean, to live there in one of those units <clears throat> and be able to go over to Oceanside and play some tennis or golf, whatever you like to do, have dinner. Uh, it's equally distant from, from Oceanside as it is just a little walk through some of those trails uh, to our riverfront. Enjoy the beautiful riverfront and the amazing sunsets that we have in our city. And then when you need uh, to run to the mail, mail place or the, or the Publix, they're just a short walk as well. I mean, it's an incredible location with a, a amazing quality of life, and you're close to the beach if you want to go hang out at the beach as well. So I'm very excited uh, not only for that project, but for the residents who will ultimately end up moving in there and living there. I think they're going to be uh, very, very pleased with their quality of life. And with that, uh, we will say good night. Thank you all.